All right, you're live. That might be people coming right now. I hear the elevator. <laughs> yeah, we have Rick Lanzer. He is our new committee member. Okay. He's the FSA person. Not representing us. <laughs> Where is he from, Andy? Rick is on a set of farm on Highway 1. Is he in my district? No. I don't know your district boundary. I got all the way around to talk to him. Yeah, he's our 57. He's about um, a mile, about a mile, two miles uh, north of Colonia. So. Okay, it's, uh, it's nine o'clock. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, okay. uh, Supervisor Jones. Here, Supervisor Ross. Here. Supervisor Matera. Here. Supervisor Chesso. Here. FSA committee member not here yet. And uh, Supervisor Julio. Here. Everybody's here except for Supervisor Earth, except for committee member. Okay. And Julie, has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Uh, are there any public comments, correspondence, or communications? I have none. Um, I move for the approval of minutes for the June second meeting. I would move to approve those minutes. I'll second. <clears throat> Motion made by Supervisor Ross, seconded by Supervisor Jokes. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. All right. University extension. Morning, everyone. How are you? I'll just give you a brief overview of uh, any of the changes in our budget. Uh, we're actually going to have a decrease in the budget for about $16,000. That's due from the regional ag educator staff moving to a state position so the state pay for her 100%. And then we took some of the professional development, we took pretty much all the professional development money out our budget since we don't have her. We did leave some of the mileage in because we have the two other educators, um, ag educators, and they may need that depending on the travel that they do. So that's, that's where we are. So we're coming under uh, from last year. Okay. So that'll be a permanent uh, reduction in the budget? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will we see her around anymore? She so, actually is out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jason, they all had her permission she's back to where she is or was before so uh, she may not always be in that office if you ever want to talk to her just send her a note and she'll arrange to be here okay yep she's here we're lucky to have her house in there yeah. yeah so we miss her too <laughs> <laughs> any uh, questions about that the budget uh, how does that and does that does that adversely affect your budget or not so much because we lost her? So it's, I mean, it's a, the overhead of losing the employee. We really haven't lost her. She's now paid at the state okay. level. So you know we still have services. Yeah. She's covering a bigger ge geography than what she was in a, a county regional role. Yeah, so I'm asking how much of it is that adversely? How is that adverse? Is that largely impact? Is that sixteen thousand dollars? Large impact for you, or we have a relatively small budget. I know, I know you're efficient. That's what I was. Yep, yep, we're efficient. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, the thing is, when we look at it, we really are mindful about okay, what technology do we need? We're all up to date. We stand on rotation, so we're not suffering at all. I do want to let you know if you don't. There's another update too, and Jamie can uh, chime in on this too. Um, we have a uh, part-time uh, support staff, Joe Larson. He's been great. Uh, you know, we hired him. What about? He hasn't been a year, right? You know, right. twenty hours county. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, Jenna was selected to help out at a state level. She's still here. She's still doing four H. But part of her salary, the salary savings that the state's going to pay, actually, we got to hire Joe for another twenty hours. So we actually have a full time support staff. Yeah in the office with no changes to our budget at all. So and Jamie gets the right curriculum yes. and that's gonna benefit our youth. So it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to share a little bit. Yeah. So um, back from camp, I told you last time I was going, I was going to be sleeping in a tent. I'm back. I made it. All right. I survived. <laughs> She's sleeping, if you know what so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have t-shirts. We signed them, too. I, we have, it was a good time. So we had 105 of us between base camp and adventure camp. I was with the adventure camp group, because it's considered higher risk. I probably spent a night with them. Uh, which included sleeping in tents and rustic cabins, and it was so much fun. Um, we did an obstacle course, we crawled through caves, um, played on Lake Paddleboard, we did all that stuff, and it was, it was um, a, good, a good time. Uh, so, anyway, we're at the point now where we're putting everything away, drawing out tents, and um, sending out surveys on camp. So, we're excited to start planning for next year. Uh, now we're moving into gearing up for our charters and the fair. I will be at the fair this year. Um, I work with the Egg Society. I will have a, an area in the Expo Center where I'll be doing a, a hands-on activity, but it's all kind of around the sports driving model. So trying to educate and remind people of the verbiage and the language that we use with this because this is a longitudinal study that we're doing statewide. So every fall when, or September when the youth enroll, we enroll for... 4-H, if they're 12 and older, they take a survey, and it's the thriving model survey, and we use that data to see how we're doing with our program, areas of need, areas that are doing well, that sort of thing, and one area that we noticed we're a little low in at the state level in, in Ozaki County, our, our number in that area, similar to the statewide, is sparks, so having what is a spark and having that language used, so you realize a spark is something um, that maybe kind of gives them purpose. It's something they get excited about. So just really using um, the time at the fair to communicate that out and get that language known and more information about the model and also make it fun. We're doing some little uh, pipe cleaner flower sculptures that go along with the model. So I can talk with everybody as they come through. So. Can you give an example? Of an example spark? of a spark? Um, sure. Uh, for instance, you a spark could be like a, it could be a challenge, but it's also maybe community development, or maybe it's helping somebody. They realize I really enjoy helping someone when they went out and they um, maybe helped at a long term care facility. Maybe they realize that's something I really enjoy. Or they were doing cleaning up a garden or planting a garden at one of the libraries, so like this, maybe horticulture or landscape development, something I really want to go into, something I have an interest in. Or maybe it's drawing and painting or dairy. Maybe they want to go, you know, their future is in the dairy industry. These are all things that they, they discover when they're younger and they're finding that children are finding this spark or interest at a very young age. It's not the teens necessarily. They find it too, but they're actually discovering their sparks earlier and earlier and kind of focusing their program and stuff, not just on teens looking for that, what they're going to do next, but how can you find that spark early on in developing it? Because you're going to have more than one spark. And 4-H is just one of those youth organizations that really allow youth to find their spark because there's so many different things that they can try. You have the arts, you have horticulture, you have dairy, you have um, egg, you have, there's just so many things that you can try, like dog training, you know. So it's really, that's your spark, finding something, a purpose, the reason you get up every morning. No, what gets you going? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's I just you're supposed to share it at least three times for everyone to remember. So this is number two. <laughs> All right, are you going to for the county fair? Are you going to ask uh, members of this committee to be herdsmanship judges again? That that was a couple of years ago, but um, and it didn't happen last year. I'm just if you haven't done it before, it's kind of a, a really neat thing. It kind of rubs you up against uh, the 4-H program, and, and the kids are, are great, and it's kind of interesting. So, oh, um, is that a fair thing? It might, it it might, yeah, I will let them know that our members of this community interested in that again. Well, I am, but okay. I, don't, I can't speak for the rest of the committee. So, yeah, I can let them know. What, 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 you do, what you do is is you go around and you uh, you talk to the kids in the various programs, uh, you know, the swine or uh, beef cattle or, you know, lambs or whatever, and, and they, they're, they're judging them, that group, on their herd.
herdsmanship, how clean it is, how much they know about it, the signage. And so you don't have to know anything about the animals themselves. So you're not yeah. ju judging the conformance of the animal, for example. Sure. But yeah, the presentation, right? It's like how cool what they do. And I, I've always enjoyed my wife and I. Okay. So. I can uh, share, share your name. And, or... and the kids are impressive, right? <laughs> it's just that, it, you know, it gives you some warm and fuzzy. Uh, and, and so it'd be another question you're getting ready for chartering. Uh, yeah, I know we took a decline over uh, years. Um, I will be interested, maybe not today, but you know, maybe at some future point about how we're doing and progressing back to pre-COVID levels and, and such. I know we're doing yeah. we're, we're um, in that direction. We just had a state meeting and I know our county is up six point one percent from last year, so we are increasing. So it's a, it's slowly going up. So we have 427 youth at this time enrolled in 4-H. So that doesn't count our volunteers. We have over 200 volunteers. Um, you know, like to see the number, you know, pushing back up closer to 500. But it's also getting those first year members to stay in too, because the greatest loss in 4-H is after that first year. So we are starting a um, new member orientation this year, where we will have. I started a newsletter the last two years with COVID. It was kind of one of the things where we did a, added a monthly newsletter to all new members where they could, there's a lot of different language and things used in 4 that you may not know. So just sending out newsletters to the new members so they could learn about things in 4 that you may not know if they're a new member. And then also um, starting orientation now too, so we can have that face-to-face -face time early on if they have questions and kind of nurturing more of that first year family, those families that don't know a lot about 4-H, because our greatest loss usually is after that first year is when you lose your most. So that's really putting more focus on that. And also reaching new members. We're starting, we did the Taste of 4-H the last year where I was going into libraries and reaching families that are not part of the 4-H program. We're expanding on that this next year. We're doing three project days and they're open to the public. There'll be a Taste of 4-H on a little bit larger um, focus so it's three projects that they can sign up for. Um, we're doing it at the fairgrounds, we're doing one here, and the other one might be here too um, in this building. So trying to reach new families that are not part of 4-H to get those first year members up and then keep them, retain them. That's kind of the area we're focusing on right now to increase 4-H. I'm hoping we'll see and also longitudinal study that they're doing. I can do a comparison every year where numbers were areas of growth that we needed to work on. So kind of that's my focus now to increase our numbers. So I'll know more in a year if those project days help, you know, bring in new um, members. But we do have, because I surveyed the families at the library, we did um, gain new members from just those three outreach um, times in this last year. So my, my hope is that we'll gain more members that way too. Are, are there areas in the county that aren't as active that maybe need more yeah. advertising for sure? Yeah, I think well overall we have we have clubs throughout the county. If you look right. at our map of clubs, we have a pretty good good stretch and we have large cop, uh, large clubs both in ports, kind of Mequon, Fiendsville. Those are our two largest, but the population is larger there too. And then uh, the clubs going north are a little smaller um, as far as numbers, membership numbers. But I don't know if it's less active or just really getting the information out, um, like into the schools more and for new families that know nothing about 4-H. Um, you know, like currently I'm leading a book, and one of the members of the book read, we're talking about the book I brought last time, um, called Sparks. It's a new family, and she didn't know about 4-H. Like this, she's new, new, never heard about 4-H, and didn't really know what it involved, and didn't know if you had to have animals to be in 4-H, that sort of thing. So really that messaging, getting in and out to, um, I think the schools and the community that what 4-H is and how you can get involved. Those multiple entry points. I missed it as a kid, but I'm impressed by it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have to leave the door open. Yes. Um, would, you, would you like to have Andy introduce our newest member? Sure. Yeah. I'm glad to, yeah, I'm glad to um, introduce Rick Lutzer. Rick is a dairy farmer. Maybe not so much dairy anymore. Yeah, you're farming what, about two, how many acres? Yeah. Yeah, he's got about 1,200 acres. He's our newest. Uh, FSA 
rep not representative, but from the FSA office on our committee now. I don't know if you want to say a few things about yourself, Rick. You know better than I. I don't know what you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the committee. I mean, the uh, I, yeah, we we have a farmer on the uh, on the committee, but uh, for so so long we. <coughs> Farmer perspective is is really important to sort of work that we do here. So thanks for. Uh, my name is Bruce Ross. I'm the uh, uh, representative from Northwest Mequon. I've been on the committee now. My name is Where are you exactly live? Like? Uh, district. I don't know for sure. What's your Where is your address? My address, address? Yeah. I live in town of Fredonia, but my address is Delta. You're on the... Right on 57. Okay. Is Joshua Haas your rep? Your supervisor? Because are you're not in the town of Sharko? No. Okay, so then you're not probably in mine at all. Yeah. You'd probably be in, in Josh's district. Yeah. I live just south of Huffman Hills. We have my homestead. Uh, we water We have 70 acres, and Bob Roden works our land. It was a farm, and my husband's father farmed it, but we never farm for a living. But we have it. It's a more picturesque than farm, but um, Bob Roden works the, the tillable land. So I have somewhat of a background in farming, and I've been on this committee quite some time. So. Um, I didn't know what to do, so I didn't really know what to expect, you know. So, so. I'm, I'm Rob Bullock. I represent Deansville. So obviously there's no farmers in my district, but, but I strongly support the farmers and stuff like that. So well, yeah, I think it's great having two farmers on the committee. I'm Kurt Shessel, Mequon, uh, District 23, farm about 400 acres. Well, yeah, last, yeah, last few farmers in that one. Oh. <laughs> uh, Tony Matera, I represent uh, uh, Central Port, Washington. Uh, thank you for joining us. Good to have a more more insight on this community from the farmer's voice. So appreciate you. Yeah, well, I guess I'll learn as a goal. But yeah. Yeah, cool. And your family has been in farming for a long time. Yeah. Right. And your brothers that have farmed. Yeah, my well, brother Larry, but like I said, I got a yeah. Larry farming in 2016, August 16, 2016. Yeah. You don't, you never forget that day to call me. <laughs> <laughs> they only went a mile from home. People say you get sick of it. If I you want to look at them, I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will help them get on the farm. Sure. I remember working with your dad a little bit years ago. Well, so, yeah, yeah. It's a long history of farming. In Ozaki County, so it's really good. Glad to have you. So, so many things have changed. You know, the farms have gotten so much bigger. You, you know, the equipment got so much better. Years ago, all of this no tilling and cover crops. What these old people would look at ain't gonna work. It it does work. It, it takes management to make it work. You know. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I came down because I have no report. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, and I know Rick, because Rick very uh my wife is uh, a neighbor of his when they were growing up. Oh, I hear all kinds of stories. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell the bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> Like 73% is now digital, um, right? Yes. Now. So it's, yeah, it's, it's strictly uh, yeah. a couple of counties that were smaller have actually hit the 100% for a month. So we're getting there. Uh, e recording is a lot easier for the office, too, because it hits the, our, uh, our system and it gets responded to right away. And if there's an issue, we bounce it back, and probably within an hour, it comes back. Instead of a week turnaround. Okay. Any other questions? Good to see your face. Yeah, I thought it was <laughs> good. See ya. So, Julie, really quick. 
I have a sign on the door. There's a, you know, there's that man working out in the hallway. So I do have a sign on the door. Yep. All right. Okay, the first item is the purchase of the Selford Belmar 246 air seater. Just for Rick's information, um, the Zaki County had some project funds available and we as uh, departments were asked to, you know, consider what types of projects we might have or, or needs that we might have. And what I did is I approached the Clean Farm Families Group and I said, if you had some monies available, what type of equipment or things would you be interested in in helping to promote cover crops and no-till our soil health initiative? And the farmer group came up with this airflow cedar. So we took it to the committee here initially, received support, and then it went to the full county board for support. And it was you know approved and everything. And now we're at the point where we're actually ready to purchase it. So I received three bids. I had a local bid here from Farmers Implement. That's out of Allenton. And they actually had the lowest price. $28,300 for that. This is for a 60 foot self-leveling, self-leveling booms on, this, on the cedar. That's got a 60 cubic foot hopper type hydraulic driven fan. I won't go through all the specs, but. And I also had a, um, another bid from Big Iron. Out of um, Culver, Wisconsin. And their bid was $33,074. Then I contacted Richie's out of Cobb, Wisconsin, and their price was $39,000. Yeah, it is quite a range. So yeah. Is that the same piece of equipment? That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, it's the same. It's a Selford 246 air seeder. Yeah. And, you know, one item I should mention the farmers implement, their, theirs was one, their, theirs was already on the lot. It was a 2021 from, from last year. And the other ones, I believe, are would have to even be uh, probably like a 2022. The main difference is the model year, but for the most part. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, we would prefer to work locally here, too, and well, yeah, yes. buy that local yeah, piece of equipment. It's already there. One company wouldn't have... The equipment available until like November of, of this year, which is past the, the season already. So, so is that going to be operated by the tractor you guys have, or is it no. going to be available for pickup? And this this piece of equipment, it's real easy to haul. We can hook it up behind our pickup, county pickup truck, deliver it to the farmers, and they can use it themselves. They can hook it up to their own tractor and 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 use the implement. So I think it'll work out pretty well. Brown County also has an airflow seeder and I contacted them to see how that's working for them. Because uh, there was a little bit of concern from some of our farmers, it's, you know, stating, well, if you give this to a new farmer and he's using it, there's always that potential of 60 foot boom, maybe hitting something. Well, I was gonna be the insurance door cuts and I asked that question. So, <laughs> yeah. so how we would own it. We would own it. And then any farmer that was to you to rent it or borrow it, would they have to show some sort of proof of insurance or some sort of, I guess, waiver that? You well, wanted? you know, we haven't got into the thicket, uh, into the thick of it like that, where we're having them, you know, send sign insurance. We we're trying to make it not complicated at all. Uh, most equipment, when it breaks, it's not an insurable thing. It's just out of your pocket. Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. If it's out of our pocket or not. Whatever. Well, well, I wouldn't think it would be responsible of whoever, whoever did the damage. Well, then we should, well, I agree. We'll actually sell that, I guess, all I'm saying. Right. We can put that into an agreement. We have agreements that they sign. Um, so far, we've been real fortunate. We haven't had any damage with, like, our cedar at all yeah but, uh, that's a good I'm, not, I'm not throwing out a, a red flag i'm, I'm very pro this i like right, right, right. trying to protect the county it's, at the same time right this is the model that way that there is no problem i think insurance would go by whose tractor is hooked up to it's yeah a lot of times well, i don't know how that works right but but most insurance doesn't pay for someone else's equipment yeah. you know error on most farms you know well but 
I mean, if it got hit on the road, yeah, your insurance, but you'd have to check with that because you also have to list all your equipment. Right. Unless you've got a clause in there for rented equipment. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, it is one road you hope you never have to cross, but. So we have insurance. I think it brings up this car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're going down the road with it, and it was hooked on your pickup truck, and you were in an accident. Most likely, if you weren't at fault, it'd be the responsibility of whoever hit you. But if you got in the accident, if you weren't, you know, insured for the value of that piece. Right. right. Are we renting it? Seems like there's some issues here that that probably should be addressed in the course of some right. sort of agreement and what what those details are, how it sorts out. Uh, you know. Yeah, and I, I don't have the agreement. I can work with you on that. Yeah, um, that would be really good. I, I do not have the agreement set yet for this piece of equipment. Are we renting it or are we we owning it? We would. Well, we're going to make this a, a revenue source. We, I'm fine with loaning it. That, that, again, the whole purpose of this is to help the farmer. So now you have a revenue source for the county. But that said, in a good partnership, we just want to protect our equipment. That's all I was looking for. So rent is just a term I use, loan, whatever. I, I, I think there's a question there, though. It, yeah. it, should it be rented or should it be loaned out? And and because there is going to be maintenance that's required on it, and there's going to be replacement if there's you know, some some downstream, if we're using this for a couple of decades or- We would be charging a fee to utilize it. Yeah, it would be wear and tear, good to your point. And, you know, in our proposal, we put down a uh, suggested fee of $4 an acre. And the idea there is you take the monies that's collected, it goes into an non-lapsing account, it builds up over the years, and when things break down, then you take that money and you use it to make a, make a repair. That's what we're thinking. Yeah, and that's what we do with the interceder planter now, too. Yeah, very good point. I'm thinking. And I'll have to look at our interceder agreement and see if we've mentioned something about insurance in there, too, regarding if something does break. I don't have it under my nose. Yeah, just, unless it's been rented. So all this time, one is so, not going to cover $28,000. Um, is this one self-contained? Because I looked, I looked up the literature yesterday, uh -huh. and, and they were actually running with a Honda engine, oh. so that you could pull them behind a pickup truck to see quickly. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you can actually seat up to rates of twenty miles per hour. I don't know who yeah. could stay in the seat, oh. <laughs> but uh, when you look at the literature, um, if that would speed things up, I just was wondering how you were ordering it or what you had. So. This has a hydraulic driven fan, right? Okay, so then we use the factor off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what the farmers were suggesting for, for that. And this would be available not just to clean farm families, but to uh, first come, first serve basis. Or... Right. Yeah, we would manage it. It's not really always first come, first serve. You find out who's all interested in using it, and you do a schedule. You try to make it the most uh, feasible schedule. So you don't call it from one end of the county to the other. Right? Yeah, not right. You're right. You, you're right. You try to work out a nice route for it. And you know, it's another tool in the toolbox. Ideally, the best thing, in my opinion, and Rick can correct me if I'm wrong, is to use a drill. Get this get the seed in the ground and have a good seed soil contact, right? This is another tool in the toolbox. It can be used for uh, seeding, doing frost seedings where People put seed on, like in March, when there's snow on the ground and the snow is just starting to, to melt. You still get freezing and thawing, work the seed into the, the soil. So that's another use for it. Uh, we also would use it for farmers that are gonna do uh, manure injection. They could come out real quickly with this piece of equipment, spread out the seed, then do their manure injection. So now they already have their cover crop seed on the ground. So now when they inject their manure, they're getting some of the seed mixed into the soil and you're gonna get a, so another cover crop. So this seed this seeder just kind of like blows it out. It so blows it out, yeah. It's and it lays on the on the soil. It's it's right. Right. Because it's a 60 foot boom and then it's got yeah. two no, there's it's all here. Oh yeah. there's, there's like an apron where the seed would drop down the, the fans probably and then it's and if the weather is real dry, you're not going to use this, you know, because you're just throwing your seed out. You have to try to time it with weather. 
and you have to make it work. Yeah. But it's another tool in a toolbox. So that kind of limits you on the amount of acres you can actually even cover with it because it's a timely thing and you, you know, yeah. aren't getting available to people. I talked with a farmer down in Racine County who, who purchased one. He farms about 2,000 acres. Brian Gunderson, he purchased one and he said it's a really good tool. He bought one. He's a soil health farmer. He does no fill and cover crops. And he likes it because he can get on, put on a lot of acres real quick, seed on a lot of acres real, real quick with the 60 foot pool. And then he says, yeah, you have to watch your weather and know when, when nice. to use it. Yeah. I've learned anything in the last three months since farming. Right. So. Yeah, that's true. Right. So. Yeah. If you have a cover crop and you see that the seed will just fall in between whatever's already in the field, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have air air action too, which helps get the seed down below the canopy too a little more. Yeah. You had a question. Or Got a motion? Is there a second? Motion by Supervisor Jobes, seconded by Supervisor Chesso. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we're on to discussion items. Yeah, the soil, soil health. I didn't know if you had any, a lot of times we get into discussions about soil health, so we put that down as a discussion item on our agenda. I would mention that we had our field day uh, roughly about two weeks ago. It was pretty well attended. I think we had about 65 farmers attend. Uh, we had some good presentations, I thought. Um, we had a load of service manure applicator there. We were able to meet at the state highway, at highway 57 plot and look at some of the differences between the plots. It's another good field day, another good opportunity to talk about soil health. We had the soil health trailer there again. Which I think is really a really a good valuable tool um, for us to always utilize and focus in on the benefits of soil. If anyone has, hasn't seen that before, it's pretty. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, yeah. On my calendar, I was actually really trying to go. Yeah. Up, 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 up. Uh, we're looking at another field day, roughly in probably September, October. A little different twist to it. Do we have a survey of uh, what farmers are using uh, soil health practices hey, hey yeah, here's my issue is always going to be yeah. you know, it seems like there's some over here who, who say no nope, that will never work here and yeah. then there's the, the true believers and there's this range in between but there's obstacles over here that 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 prevent farmers from adopting practices that that this group over here says are working right now oh, right so so what i'm interested in from a natural resources committee perspective is what are those obstacles uh, and how you know specifically what are those obstacles and and then what are we doing to address them and i guess i you know, I, I enjoy those those field days uh, and i enjoy yeah. the the presenters that you have in. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're not just preaching to the choir, we're, you know, and, and it grows a little bit, right? I, right, I recognize right. there's a little bit of viral mm -hmm. uh, uh, growth, but I think there would be value to this committee considering specifically identify first, what percentage of, of the county is has adopted these practices that we think are good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then second, what are the obstacles to implementing it in those areas that where it, it's not being adopted. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I think we might be able to help move the ball I, I, by really having a good deep discussion about what those obstacles are and then how do, how do we address them? Yeah. Whether it's, it's financial risk, it's in momentum, it, uh, it's history of the farm or it's I don't have the equipment or or what we you know, understanding that mm -hmm. is i think really important to how do we move the ball downfield in this thing that provides societal benefits to the county yeah we probably had a good point where it would be good to send some sort of a survey out too i mean to try to have a more comprehensive survey to learn more i i 
you know, as we work with people, I think we know already what some of the obstacles are. So. Well, and, and that if I were to ask Rick and not to put you on the spot, but I will, I guess. What 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 are what would you say are some of the main reasons why farmers hesitate to change from a conventional farming method to one of no-till and cover crops? Financial, it's a real old-fashioned word, stubborn. You know, you grew up with a habit from an old stuff in Luxembourg, we have curves. It's hard for older people to try new things once in a while. You know, that's just the way of saying it, but it really, I don't think they really know it. You have to prove to them it's going to work first. Like I said, some people can be, myself included, can be stubborn once in a while. Oh, You've worked with farmers your whole life, you know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, these grandpas, we know, you know? Yeah. Change is hard, right? I mean, it's. The clay unique soil composition of, of this area is, is an impediment. Uh, we're too close to Lake Mission that the microclimate caused by the, the proximity to that, that water body. Um, I, I mean, I, I've heard those things, whether they're, you know, I, I don't know. I was with a farmer on a Saturday and he was growing those up things out that were next to Lake Michigan. It's different here. And I said, yes, it's different here, but soil health, the soil health principles work here, but you have to manage maybe a little differently. You know, you if it's cooler, you can use different growing degree days, uh, corn, uh, you manage differently here. You can make it work. But yeah, it's different here. The soils are different here. You gotta have the right equipment. I know in our neighborhood, I see this. One, the resistance to change is obviously the big factor. But another thing is the age of the farmer. And if he's at a point that he's only got 10 more years to go, he doesn't want to change all this equipment and yeah. step into that. That doesn't mean that in the future, that land isn't going to be yeah. run by somebody else that may do this. Yeah. But at this point in time, no, I'm not going to go do that because I'm done and so on. You so that's, and the, you know, if you read the papers, you know what the situation as far as age of farmers is. You, this is a big factor. So you mentioned change of equipment. The Clean Farm Families Group now, they're providing a $2,000 incentive for farmers when they do convert their equipment from conventional to no-till. So we, we have three farmers now and younger farmers that put in to change their corn planter from a conventional planter to a no-till planter. And that's with the, a younger farmer group that's doing that. But that's a big factor. Yeah. Who is going to take over after that farmer if that new person will go with these methods? Sometimes we don't know who. Yeah. It could be bought out by one of them that that's already in our program and doing, but the others are there. But they're at a point that they're not going to go into something new because in a few years they're done. What happens to the land, that we will see. But obviously, we'd like to see this go forward. Yesterday, I got on the phone and actually talked to some of the board members of your clean farm families. And, and my impression is, your whole farm is not always going to work with everything that you want to do, that it's a balance of everything. A lot depends with the previous crop, so forth. I know in my experiments, I ended up with slugs and winter wheat stubble and things like that that ate the corn and, and things like that. It's a way of managing. You can use it, but uh, when I was talking to I'm not going to name any names, but uh, you know, he says that you can't manage to get your whole farm in it, but you can work with it. And uh, I think, I mean, I look around, I mean, you, you might say some of these guys are stubborn. I got all no-till equipment. I don't go 100% no-till, mainly because I know I have issues after certain crops and so on and so forth that don't, don't respond well. And when you say you can manage by degree days on the corn and stuff, you're going to cut your yields, which then in, in the end is going to be in your pocket. So... You have to do a balance of everything of what what's going to work. I think we got to look at the overall perspective. Uh, I look at a lot of. I actually took photographs of a lot of no-till farms, and I see massive runoff, massive ravines of ruts, and things like that. The water runs faster. 
but yet I'm told that the water is going to penetrate the sink in easier. Is that true? I don't know, but I'm, I'm you know, in my own opinion and looking around, um, I think it, it all needs a balance because you can have uh, minimal tillage, leave a lot of trash on top, solve the problem of, of getting certain fields to dry off faster in spring and still have product on top and so on and so forth. So, I mean, the, the whole idea of cover crops are the only answer, I don't agree with that. Um, I did spend, you know, I had to go to some family functions on the western side of the state and I drove through Dodge County. I was out in Baraboo. I looked at some of their watersheds next to some of their rivers where they did cover crops or whatever. They're all planted later. They're all farther behind. I talked to agronomist from United Co-op and he agreed with me. Um, so, I mean, those are all the financial things you got to look at. And if it's, if it's in your toolbox that year that you want to do it that way. I mean, that's, that's my point of the, the whole thing. I think you can use it, but I don't think you can use it 100%. You know, what happens though is, this is my experience and I'll, I'll put it on the table. Uh, a lot of times it takes time for the soils to change too. And to try this one year and not follow through for five years or six years, you know, you, you try it once and the soils haven't even changed yet. And you say, well, it doesn't work. You know, you have to, the people that have been doing it a long time will, will say, start slow, don't put your whole farm into it. Start slow, learn, and learn your equipment, learn about cover crops, learn about what seed mixture works best for you, but do it gradually, but try to get it done on your whole farm eventually because, and do it long-term because it has to, you have to do cover. If you're gonna just do no-till and without cover crops, the experts would say, well, no, you should be doing cover crops and no-till for a long time to get the biology and the soil going. To just do a straight no-till without cover crops, you don't know a lot of times you have the biology to mellow out your soils and to change it so that water can get into it. I think there's gotta be a long-term commitment to it, then you have to wanna make it work too. I mean, that's, this is what I hear from farmers who have been doing no-till and cover crops for like 15 or, you know, Years. So I don't know the right answer, you know, 100%, not 100%. Not 100%. And I, and I, 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 I'm not trying to pretend I'm, I'm ever going to know that. Uh, but from a, a strategic, what's the county's role in this perspective? It would be useful for me, I don't know, for the committee, yeah. but useful for me to know what our strategy is and, you know, how we're marketing. You know what how we're approaching that and what are you know the, to develop a strategy you have to understand what the obstacles are uh, and then you have to apply resources to overcoming those obstacles um, and so i i mean what is, it feels to me like we're doing a really good job with the clean farm families and, and you know, doing that you know that incremental expansion out um, but where is that going right and, and yeah. is that enough? I guess that's that's my question from a, just a manager's viewpoint. Is is that what we should be doing, or is that is there more that we should be doing to realize the societal benefits, including farmer profitability? Because I want to keep farms on the landscape. Um, how can what's the role of the county in in facilitating that? We don't own it. We can't mandate it. We don't want to mandate it. But how do we facilitate it most effectively? And that we're, we're spending thirty thousand dollars. We bought a tractor for seventeen thousand um, dollars, and we're investing a lot of energy right. and discussion, and you and your your people. And, you know, are we moving the ball? Are we moving the ball more effectively? Should we make more investments? Uh, and where would those be most useful? I guess that's kind of from a manager's perspective. What I'd be looking for from where we're going at this program. So I, I, yeah, that's one opinion of five. That's all. I mean, right right now you're basically got a your clean farm families area. You've got a mapped out mm -hmm. area, yeah. And so you're not really covering the whole county per se. Well, it's it's open to the entire county, and we have different. But as far as but as far as getting money back for seed or stuff or whatever, those fields have to be in those mapped areas. Correct? Well, now it's county wide. Uh, it, it originally started out, it was just the Milwaukee River watershed area. 
<clears throat> and then we changed that last year to include all of Ozaki County. So it's a county-wide program now. So farmers outside the Milwaukee are eligible for these incentive payments too now. Is that because it was funded by like a fund for like Michigan or something like that? that or, or actually, actually, it was really initiated by the farmers. We had a um, one farmer in particular. We'd have our field days, and he says, "Why can't I be a part of the group?" And uh, I went to the state and says, "Well, we really were the smallest county in the state. It would be nice if we could have a county-wide funded area." And they they agreed to do that then. So they, they bent the rules a little bit, I guess. But originally it was by watershed by watershed. But they agreed to make it be countywide. Well, I think it's good that we're helping farmers with no till and stuff like that because it's it's a major investment to switch over. Right. We also have to keep supporting the farmers that aren't doing no till too, obviously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the state, you know, they they felt that farmer to farmer led is the best approach to get more farmers to do, to do you know, change over and uh, it's happening yeah it is it's it slow is. it's slow I, 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 I grant that and, and you know we're doing more researchy type things here in our area too now with watching the soil change over time um, we're looking more at the economics, not just now on the Highway 57 plot, but at some of the other plots. You have um, NRCS is more involved now in our plots, evaluating them as well. Is that setup fee for when you're talking about converting the no-till, is that a one-time per farm, or is that if they replace a planter and upgrade the next one? You know, that discussion came up a few weeks ago. Uh, Right now, it's it's a one-time conversion, right? And it's only two thousand dollars. Right. I, I converted a corn planter; it cost me eight grand. What's well, that? I said I converted a corn oh, yeah. planter; it cost me eight thousand dollars. Right, and it can be a lot more than that too. Yeah, but it's a one. Right now, it's a one-time type payment, and the maximum payment that's provided is three thousand dollars per farm, per farm, just to make the money go further. So finances is an impediment, one of the impediments, one it of the is. obstacles. You know, are there ways that we can help with that? And and, and you know, I, I would suggest that there are. There's a lot of grant opportunities out there. We the county board has made a commitment to really? uh, investing in this. Um, so I, I guess that's where I mean, what's what's the holistic picture look like, and how do we you know address each one of those obstacles to maximize that farmer to farmer? A progression of, of practices that to the maximum extent possible, whether it's 100 or not, I don't know, but to the maximum extent possible in Ozaki County. That's, I think, that's my dog in this NRC issue. And you know, we talk about profitability with time. From what I know and study and hear from farmers who've been doing it for a longer period of time. They do it because they want to make more money. They want to be more profitable. And I know I mentioned it last time, the Cargill Company and the National Soil Health Institute interviewed 100 farmers who have been doing cover crops and no-till for quite some time. They found that their net income, their net profitability for corn increased by like $50 per acre. So it was $47. So over time, it can be more profitable, but you have to get to that point. And there's hiccups when you're gonna have a good year, a bad year. Um, the county did set aside thirty thousand dollars for incentives, so now that'll be up to this committee to determine how they're put to use. Well, that, yeah, and that money was rolled into the clean farm families, right? We incentive. Is that about the fifty that you got the grant for? Army? Is that about the 50 that, that you have the grant for? Yeah, yeah, the Fund for Lake Michigan provided 50, Ozaki County provided uh, 30 for incentive payments. So that was rolled into the Clean Farm Families program and that became countywide. Yeah, well, I think it's no. indicative of the willingness of the county board to consider uh, investing in this this thing that affects really all of us. So, I, I, but knowing where to invest that. Right. I, 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 I think having a plan is helpful to getting everybody on board with that. 
So that would be my suggestion to the committee that, that we would expect uh, Andy to come up with a plan that addresses how we're going to take what we're doing and and kind of do do it more or better or further or whatever. Yeah, I, you know, it probably would be a good start to do a good survey. So you would farmer you survey to see, let them identify, tell us where we haven't done a real detailed survey yet. Maybe it's time we, we do that. Our survey is more of an ignorance question. Our survey is more uh, better response than like a town hall, whiteboard, come talk, express your grievance, but <laughs> whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering which one would be more effective. I don't. You know, initially what I thought would be really cool would be to have a small group of farmers, well, farmers maybe get together. Some who have been doing this for a while and um, others who maybe have told us they're not really interested and just maybe talk about what are some of the challenges. Surveys are nice, but they're hard to get farmers and others to complete surveys. Well, that's right. that's, that's why we have, have hesitated to do surveys. And, and, and to your earlier point of preaching to the choir, I mean, we send them to like almost your freedom and lost your successes, but we specifically target non helpful, uh, non clean part, non uh, soil issue. And it's not just Ozaki County either. I mean, it's, there's other counties that are doing this. And, uh, oh, I awesome. think the reason, yeah, and I think the reasons are probably county wide, country wide, actually, why. People hesitate to change. Actually, I think the whiteboard mini farmer meeting is maybe the best way to go. The problem with that is you have to statistically try to apply, but you can identify what the issues are to try to address them. Okay, Sam, then I think we can move on. Um, to, let's see, no, I have to tell you something else. <laughs> I'm going to be moving on too. I feel like I can't just sit here. Uh, I'm looking at retirement too. I'll leave it in mid August. But I'll tell you what happened. Um, MMSD approached me to work like 40 hours a month as a soil health person to work one on one with farmers to help better promote soil health. One on one, by that I mean, when they're out, if they're in. They're going to switch over to no-till, be out there when they're planting, make sure they're planting probably at a two inch depth, not an inch depth, maybe like they would otherwise. They feel that somebody has to really be out in the field working closely with farmers. And they, they had asked if I would be willing to do that. And I, I tell you what, I truly believe in soil health. I can't just, I've been struggling with this retirement for a long time. I love my job. I love Ozaki County. But I'm at the point where I'm not any younger and my time has come. And I have grandkids and everything else. And I feel I feel sick about it actually yeah, that I'm gonna retire, but I I thought I feel sick about it. No, I, it's, it hasn't been easy for me. And then just now with being able to know that MMSD is allowing me to continue on and something I really believe in, it'll be good for I I hope I can make a difference. That's what I'm saying. But yeah, I'm at that point where I'm going to be moving on too. So I can't just sit here like, yeah, I'm going to be here forever either. Killing us, Yeah, no. no. Short time on the board, you definitely. No, I feel <laughs> Rick is new, and we're introducing Rick, and we're going to take his knowledge and your. So you got to retire. You're thinking about retiring soon? Yeah. Within a year or two? Well, yeah, that's that's one. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's a little shocking, right? Did um, you know this? Did somebody that can take your place? Of course I do it, but it's not up to me to announce it. Succession planning is where I was going with that. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, speaking for myself, I, you know, I'm disappointed that that you're you're. Really <coughs> Having made progress, progress that county staff that uh, we have, uh, and and the idea that you're going to be working with MMSD to continue the yeah. uh, the the progress is is encouraging and hopeful, and it, and it kind of plants the idea of a seed to the point of where's the county willing to make investments if 
if you're successful with MMSD uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis in spreading the, you know, helping farmers make that transition if, if they want to, uh, yeah. maybe that's a, an investment opportunity for the county as well. So, you know, but that's what, that's kind of like those creative ideas is, is what we need to be kind of managing from an NRC perspective so that we can make the investments in the right, in the right, right. location. So, right. Um, and I would be still helping in Ozaki County, in Washington County, Farnham County, yeah. Sheboygan County, in the regional, in the RCP project area. And outside the area too, where farmers are influential on the success of working with people within the water. Is this an official announcement or you're still? I don't think he's put it in writing yet. Well, I have to put it in writing yet, but yeah, I, I am at the point where you're all this together. I, we're all in this together and I feel in all due respect to you, I need to talk about things. You gotta do this best for yourself. We all work together. Well, I mean, I, I'm no spring chicken anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of people within the last Five years, when are you retired? So I love my job. I'm not retiring yet. I'm probably the oldest guy, one of the oldest guys around. And, and to be honest, it sounds like a perfect opportunity for you. you can it sounds like a one. You can go down to a, a quarter of the hours you're doing now. And, uh, when I can learn, I have time to really dive into it more, to learn more and work just more closely. And I'm really glad for that opportunity, really, because I can work with some of these guys that I know nationally yet, and they can help me help others here too. You know? Oh, sorry, I spent tough on <laughs> No, it really has. Yeah, yeah. I can't help you. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I have to spend tough. Just don't go changing your phone up, so you can still lean on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's. To be continued on that for sure. Um, the floodplain mapping update. Well, Supervisor Ross had a question, post me a question directly about how many acres might be impacted by the mapping. So I reached out to Elizabeth Finley. She's the DNR person that's in charge of the floodplain mapping. And she um, sent this email out. Basically, what I can tell you from what I received is that there's more land now likely in the floodplain than there have been in the past. I can't tell you exactly where there's there's more land in the floodplain. It's not real substantial. I mean, if you're looking at the zone AE there, it was it's 10,000 acres now and preliminary with the new one, it's gonna be 3,000 acres more possibly. But you have to know that the zone A, if you look down, zone A in that column, zone A's are unstudied floodplains. So they, they haven't been studied. They're identified as a floodplain. They're unstudied, but now some of them are being studied. So now they become an AE floodplain. So the zone A's went down and some of those zone A's were added to the AE. So how much did that floodplain really increase as far as the amount of acres is a little, questionable there. And the zone VE, that's just, that's a new zone. That's a, um, a zone that considers wave runoff in the floodplain. So I can't really take that into account. But to get at Supervisor Ross's question, the impact is went up, not significantly, but it has increased. It impacts the properties, obviously. Right. As far as being able to build and stuff like that. We see a lot of properties now along Lake Michigan that are no longer in the floodplain. Their homes, which was real, real surprising. We don't need to spend a lot of time on this. I yeah. just thought that uh, the, in, in my personal situation, I had a little bit less floodplain, uh, incrementally less. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, for those whose property is now considered in the floodplain, is aware of it. I know there's been public notification. Uh, what does that mean to their their property value? What uh, flood insurance uh, are they imposed on them? 
and it seems like you know the government is changing the rules in the middle of owning the property. I, I don't know if there's anything that the county can tell you about that. But uh, thank Wait, you for reaching Is there an appeal process or a there is that's that's ongoing now. People can actually how much can it actually be appealed and changed? That I don't know. Is it they're going by maps and stuff? They're not actually getting out the field of yeah, and with zoning and Senate, uh, zoning and floodplain, uh, real time things change. They, they really do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, about the three uh, Charlotte and floodplain zoning ordinance revisions. So, yeah. so Ozaki County, we participate in the FEMA community rating system. It's a floodplain program through the insurance services office. And we, I think we're like, there's maybe three counties in the state that participated in it. So we do educational programs and things to make people more aware of issues regarding the floodplain. Anyhow, we're, we're in a certain class. We're in a class eight. The class, because we're in a class eight, people who purchase flood insurance get a 10% discount. So we used to be in a class nine, but we took on a few more things to do and we were put into a class eight. Because we're in a class eight, they're telling us now another prerequisite to be in class eight is we have to change our ordinance to make it make a change. And the, the, the basic change is that all all floors, like if you have a, a, a basement, lowest floor of a house or whatever, it has to be one foot above the regional floodplain elevation. Right, right now our ordinance says if you have a garage, your floor could be at the regional flood elevation. Now it would have to be one foot above the regional flood elevation. So that would be the major change that we would have to make in our ordinance. I was hoping to work on this and present it to you next month in August. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I have certain things I want to get done too before I leave. And this is one of them, and let's get the ball rolling on it because it has to be done this year. And then, with that, in our office over the last couple of years, we've identified changes that we'd like to see in our ordinance too, just to clarify things. Whenever you have these ordinances, people come in, you know, these gray areas, we're going to try to eliminate some of the gray areas. So I'm hoping I can have some time and draft, uh, amend the ordinance and present it to you next month and then get your input on it. So, to make sure I understand the context. Uh, so you know, the flood maps have changed. Uh, we're talking about creating zoning in county zoned areas that would increase the requirement by one foot of the street board. Right. Yeah. And it's it's not a one foot of what used to be just a floor garage now is one foot of nine foot below ground based it's a one foot box. So it's not. Oh, potentially 10. I have to tell you though, just no, there, there's a little more to it also. Uh, state of Wisconsin, in the state of Wisconsin, if someone's going to build a house in the floodplain, a new house, they 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 have to be two feet above the regional flood elevation already. It's already enacted. Which a is lot of what we have in Wisconsin meets this federal program too. But in our ordinance right now, we say that floors of garages and so could be at the base flood elevation. Yeah. But now we have to make sure those. So it's more of the accessory structures that are most greatly impacted. Yeah. And most people that are in the floodplain don't put a basement in, you know. So, yeah. okay, so you're going to bring certain inspection from up to the That's my plan. I, I hope I can, you yeah. know. I'm hoping we have the budget done too. That's why I'm going to work with Jason to get that done. Great. Okay. Yeah. All right, number C, management financial informational reports. I wanted to mention we closed on the 1936 Edgewater property yesterday. So that was done. So now we have all 
two properties, county ownership, and the next step then is to work with the highway department and uh, work on demoing those properties and each sort of site. We purchased properties in the, we had a special project area uh, on Edgewater Drive, which is between Grafton and Sockville. And there were homes in the floodway of the Milwaukee River. And the floodway is moving waters of it. When you get a flood, it's the moving waters. And we, we had participated with Grafton, FEMA, and the DNR, got grant money and, and bought these properties and take the structures out of the floodplain make open space, the open space becomes part of River Oaks County Park. That's kind of in a nutshell. Okay, is that it? Thank you. Um, Ms. Andrew, we're not funny in purpose. You're right. Twice before, also. Yeah. <laughs> I've been so lucky. Congratulations to Andy. He's, Andy deserves it as much as anyone, so congratulations. I started working with Andy, so it's a little bit of respect. Number one, increase of revenue budget amendment for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation National Coastal Resiliency and Habitat Restoration. Awesome. Um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, grant we have applied for a uh, fairly large grant is to um, uh, correct some fish passage issues within Mineral Springs Creek. Uh, as you know, several years ago, we removed a dam. Uh, we, in 2018, we had some severe floods that, that impacted that area uh, in general. Um, in response to that, uh, some of the infrastructure was compromised. The city of Fort Washington's infrastructure, a fairly large sewer main, um, was uh, it crosses the creek upstream, and um, it was, uh, was not only exposed, but kind of hanging. <laughs> Um, so it was, it was uh, so the city of Fort Washington proceeded with an emergency fix uh, to that, um, to that water uh, sewer main. Um, it, but in effect, uh, that, that solution, and again, they needed to do it relatively quickly, but in, in effect, that solution created a new dam um, on the creek and, and preventing fish passage. So, you know, prior to, to all that, you know, uh, we invested in, in many projects which are on the map there, up, up and down Mineral Springs Creek and in partnership with the city, frankly, um, on a lot of these projects and also partnership with We Energy. So there's probably been, a, you know, half or half to up to a million dollars invested already. Um, so Fish Passage is one, but also this grant really addresses sustainability of that, that creek and the infrastructure, et cetera. So it's really intended to you know, find a, a sustainable solution to, to these issues um, long term. So um, the grant anyway would help uh, fund basically reconstruction of that uh, creek bed um, and, the, and the bluffs and that really that whole Mineral Springs Creek corridor one to uh, reinstate and ensure fish passage, but as importantly kind of protect the uh, infrastructure in that area. So um, so we uh, fairly competitive national grant. Um, it's been a long time in coming. We've had many uh, interviews and so forth on the, on the grant, but um, we were awarded it. Uh, the grant is for uh, 400, 404,500. Um, and you can see kind of the project area. So there is the, the main project area kind of um, between Ravine and uh, Oakland or Division Street, and then uh, a further part uh, south uh, by the We Energy Power Plant. Um, so 
Part of the project also is to do some restoration, habitat restoration in that project area, and that included Oakland Creek Park. So uh, as we knew when we applied for the grant and mentioned, um, the the funder not only not only uh, National Fish and Wildlife but also our national funds from DNR and from the Michigan Appendix, um, you know, wanted to ensure the long term protection of that restoration project um, because because of kind of this history again, uh, you know. It was extreme situation, but because of this history, to kind of ensure that long term protection. So, uh, and also public access. So, one of the things uh, that this grant in particular is requiring is that that kind of permanent protection. And that can take, you know, a, a number of forms. What we had proposed is just having an easement on Oakland Green Park, because that will be uh, kind of a restoration of that, to create a buffer, protect the ravine, protect the infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but it could potentially also be uh, a transfer of the deed for Oakland Green Park to the county to ensure, uh, and we're, we're bound by our grant restrictions to ensure that long term protection. Uh, there's been discussion with the city, frankly, um, uh, city staff was interested just because knowing uh, the expertise of maintaining that, that natural landscape and area. They were interested in, in possibly doing the deed, but obviously that's you know for further construct uh, further discussion. Um, but the grant will accepting the grant and giving you the back thing, but accepting the grant will at least require that that conservation with nerve protection, uh, permanent protection of the restoration, which again I met with the city of Port Washington, one or the other is is on the table and was approved by the city. Uh, there preference right now is to look at that possible deed just so that um, you know, they can get that technical assistance to, to maintenance, but it doesn't have to be that. So um, everybody's very much looking forward to this. I, I should also say, um, you know, the DNR did issue an order to the city um, to resolve the fish passage because of the emergency fix. So um, this is significantly helping the city uh, address that issue at, at um, very low cost. The city is a partner. We did ask them to partner. It was uh, to provide for the local match. And, and one of the requirements of our fund for like Michigan grant was to have them uh, financially invested, um, which they have committed to as well. So it, it's great. It's only a, a fraction of the total cost. The total project cost will be about 800,000. The city is contributing 65. Um, and um, and we'll be getting the other match from from uh, other uh, other existing grants that the, the county uh, has. So, sixty five hundred or sixty five thousand. Sixty five thousand. Sorry, did I say hundred? Sixty five thousand. Um, just so you know, I mean, the city obviously that that well, I shouldn't say obviously. It, it's coming from you know the water utility and stuff. They they would. Because of the DNR order, though, they would be responsible for a fix here that would probably be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe not the full scope of what we're doing, because we're doing a little bit additional for to be competitive for this grant, but um, but certainly much more than sixty-five thousand. Um, we also did all the engineering and design, so that's not even accounted for here, and we were able to fortunately do that in house. All permits and stuff are issued. So uh, this would be acceptance of that grant, but I just wanted to point out, you know, at the very least, uh, the county will need to get a, a conservation easement for that area. Well, we've already accepted the grant, right? I mean, we have, part we have, the this is a budget amendment. amendment. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to, to point out that nuance. It was understood that we were gonna have to do an easement, but I wanted to point out that nuance. The city is also you know, possibly looking at the fee transfer. I'll move to move. Motion by Supervisor Matera, second by Supervisor Jones. All in favor? Just, I just, just want to, I mean, this, it, it seems like the city's ready to deed it over to us. Um, you know, that requires a county board yeah. discussion. It's a new park, right? right. So we, we know there's issues, have been issues with that in the past, but um, if, I mean, I, I guess. We've already accepted the grant with the caveat that there'd be an easement. Mm -hmm. 
and we know the city is uh, amenable to that. The grantor is amenable to that, and, and you know we, we have to work through that process. But that can be that can be the best step to, to having an accepted grant. Call the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Yes. Um, second, uh, piece of revenue budget amendment for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Office of Great Waters Grant for Acquisition of Lake Bluffs and Cedar Quarry and, and Nature Preserve. Um, just as just as a preface, I also have this as a discussion item because I can give you further updates. So I'll try and keep my comments just to this, but. So this is a grant we did talk about. I did kind of have it in our figures. Uh, just as a real quick uh, reminder, um, the county would be bringing uh, $2.6 million to closing for acquisition. Um, and that is through uh, competitive federal grants and a $200,000 contribution by the county. So 2.4 million in federal grants, which, which includes this 450. Um, 2.4 million in, in federal grants, $200,000 commitment by the county. And the land trust right now is uh, would be bringing the remaining $2.4 million uh, for our for our purchase price of 5 million acquisition. So, so while we anticipated this and the uh, signs were good, uh, it's been confirmed. So that's what this is, is a budget amendment to accept the $450,000. Um, you can see the list of other grants that we have there already um and kind of a funding map as to how that that also breaks out we've been going through a lot of work on that i can explain later but um some, some changes and things to make this possible um so uh it would be to accept the 450 from epa um, and the likely time of award is sometime in july I would make the recommended motion. So this, uh, we get to the new discussion. Motion by Supervisor Ross. There's a second. Second by Supervisor Matera. Any other comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Hold. Number three, submittal and acceptance of the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Office of Great Waters Grant for a Lake Sturgeon Habitat Assessment and Management Plan for the Milwaukee River. So as you know, we've been working on this for a while. Um, we did a we did a, a detailed inventory of the Milwaukee River with site scan sonar, uh, classified the sediment, identified uh, habitat areas for Lake Sturgeon. We also just recently modified the Mequon Beansville Fishway that would better accommodate Lake Sturgeon. Um, the DNR approached us. They are working with UWM to do the, to follow our methodology in Milwaukee County uh, to do the side scan sonar and classified sediment. They're basically um, looking to us uh, to help facilitate that work um, because they're gonna be following our, our model and our, our work uh, up in Ozaki County. So this funding is really to continue that process towards, towards the statewide um, statewide Lake Sturgeon Habitat Management Plan, but also one for uh, Southeast Wisconsin that really focuses on the Milwaukee River. So um, the, the grant would be to really help facilitate uh, this work and provide some guidance. And also where we can, um, we're gonna be, um, or I shouldn't say we're gonna, yeah. Also identified from our previous study, for get a little bit more detail. So velocities are key. Uh, in addition to sediment, so we'd be getting a little bit more detailed uh, data that would ultimately really, um, would ultimately lead to design and engineering if um, if there are found suitable sites for you know habitat projects in the Milwaukee River for for Lake Sturgeon. Um, so again, the uh, the bulk of the funding here is for our staff time and. Uh, there is no required management. And again, this is was kind of an invite only um, from the Austin Water Stream uh, for, for our assistance. Kind of like for us. Continue, continue what we've been kind of kind of light in that time frame where we're waiting yes. for some, some yeah. that are coming back up the river. Right? Yeah, Lake Surgeon take um, so males about 20 years, females about 25 years. 
to get to sexual maturity. So uh, to um, not get into all the detail, but River Edge has been stocking sturgeon for a long time uh, since I think 2006. Or so. order. Order. Uh, my part of the meeting is done. Yes, I think that is. I'll, I'll walk up with you. Thank, thank you for joining us. I know whom you're in. Welcome. 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 Well, what's the courthouse energy? Right? Yeah, I mean, That's a long time. Right? Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you for you all. I'll be back. Right. 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 Oh, no. Uh, so, anyway, um, yeah, so they take that long to return. River Edge has been stocking. Sturgeon are very um, uh, imprinted on the chemistry of the, uh, of the creek. So, just like salmon, they will come back to where they were born uh, to spawn. And so that's that's the um, the process behind kind of getting them to return uh, through that stocking program naturally to the Milwaukee River. And then the next step is really that being able to identify suitable habitat where we have it great, where we don't though, it's to uh, possibly look at a restoration that would provide that suitable habitat. So we know we have some, um, but we also know that there's um, you know more more that likely could be done with with this uh, study. Yeah. So we're I think River Edge was 2006. It should be in here somewhere. Um, yeah, so we are getting very close to that. And actually, just another quick note is DNR in the last three years has been noticing sturgeon all the way up to Clack I mean, one river, so mature sturgeon. So the first ones to come back are the males and they kind of scout things out, if you will. Um, so it it is working and well, and they're very excited. And yeah, what we're expecting. Them to start moving up. So in, the, in the early years, they used to release some things of dam, just below the dam. And wasn't there a concern about predation or? Uh, yeah. yeah. As they're as they're working their way down, and the, the, the shallow. Uh, yeah. They get fucked up by. Like, absolutely. Yeah. So a couple of things: the, the sturgeon stacking program and the and lake sturgeon day used to happen in Thiesville Park, which I really enjoyed. They moved to the Lakeshore State Park. That was a function of two things exactly like uh, Chairman Holyoke mentioned is one, the long journey down to the lake and the loss or, of survivability in that journey from predation. But the other was we had a couple years of very low water in, each year in a row. And so the other thing is that a lot of the um, stocking, uh, the young, young sturgeon were not making it down to Lake Michigan because of water levels also. So they eventually moved it down to Lakeshore State Park, which also provides, you know, for a bigger audience and stuff. But we, of course, were biased at these we thought it's really nice site and stuff. So, but yeah. Okay. All right. Looking for a motion for um, submittal of this and acceptance. I'll make the motion. Motion by Supervisor Ross, second by Supervisor Chesso. I do have a, just a, one more thing to ask about. I mean, or just to clarify in my own head. So we're we are providing really this service. I mean, I guess I'm trying to. It's kind of a service to Milwaukee County, or um, is it to the it, DNR? It's really the DNR. Is it ourselves trying to make sure that the work we've done upstream is is supported by work that's going to be done downstream? All all three. Um, okay. All three, but prim primarily, actually, it's going to be new data collection for us in Ozaki County. We're going to be actually monitoring velocities. We're going to be getting more, more. So we got we got the good classification of sediment, but we need a few more things to actually narrow down um, potential areas for habitat. So we're going to be doing that piece in Ozaki County, okay. but it's also to facilitate what facilitate <laughs> our methodology in Milwaukee County. So it's okay. I guess it's all three. That that helps. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm going to call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Cool. Submittal and acceptance of Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Office of Great Water Grant for Fish Passage Activities and Silver Beach Creek and Sucker Creek. So it's a little bit of a uh, similar situation, kind of. Um, uh, same funding source, Oscar Great Waters approached us. 
we are currently working on both East Creek Silver and Sucker Creek. Um, and the DNR is very interested. Um, one of their goals is to, uh, you know, help facilitate getting these creeks off the 303 D list. Uh, one of those things is uh, doing some of these uh, habitat restoration projects. So they approach us about continuing our work. We had done an inventory. We're, we're only a, addressing uh, a portion of those with funding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, now we're under, uh, we're doing construction on those. Um, and it would, so it'd be the rest of those projects on um, Sucker Creek and, and Silver Beach. So um, they're looking to help us fund and continue um, working on those, those projects. Uh, it's also just, um, I think we've talked about before and, and Andy's been um, very involved as well, but uh, we're part of kind of a Sucker Brook Friends group and also uh, more, more recently, it was like the County Watershed Coalition kind of coordinating some efforts, uh, joint efforts on Sucker uh, Brook, which includes um, uh, some work on the headwaters uh, uh, up at the um, Career Foundation property. So it's kind of a, a nice addition to the partnership and uh, helps the DNR address some of the work that they're doing and also work that we've identified for our fish passage work. Uh, again, the uh, majority is uh, both staffing and then obviously construction dollars. Um, we continue to to use highway when we can for the construction because a lot of these are are um, you know, some of them are simple culverts, uh, but others are a little bit more involved construction. Is there a motion. So moved. By. Supervisor Matera, second by Supervisor Jobes. Any other comments? $59,000 of, of purchased rock. Yes. Uh, so I, is that coming from the highway department's budget? Nope, that was a previous grant that we rolled over. Um, we were able to acquire the grant under our existing Sucker Brook Creek. And it looks like we're not going to need all that rock, so we're basically rolling it forward to, to be able to use the cash. So it's it's stuff that uh, rock that we bought for Sucker Brook Creek with grant funds, and we'll we'll be using that as cash. So the the DNR is aware of. Yes. Okay. Call a question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Number five. Good and contract construction related services for the Wabadonia Park caretakers roof replacement. Yeah, so this is one of the capital projects. Um, we went to bid. Uh, we had a lot of people pull the plans, as you can see from the plan set. Unfortunately, we just got one bid. Um, we did reach out to folks. Uh, having said that, though, the one bid uh, is Rams General Construction. Uh, he is the same person that we've used on uh, our other roof construction projects uh, over the last three years. So he did Miquan um, Park, um, our caretaker house. He did Miquan Golf Course. Um, uh, modifications, if you will, to the maintenance building. He did our park superintendent's uh, roof uh, at Shady Lane. Um, so in those previous biddings, he was always low, um, pretty significantly. Um, so we do feel confident uh, that this is a good bid and we're suggesting awarding it. Um, so the total bid was for the garage and the caretaker and also the house, 30,000 for the house. 15,000 for the um, garage. We're recommending a contingency just in case. Um, the budget provided through the capital was 40,000, um, but we're gonna make up the difference with um, the sale of some old equipment that we were able to take to auction and, and sell and kind of organizing and cleaning things out. Old, old um, whale mowers and things like that that we uh, haven't used in a while. So the sale of those auction um, should cover the balance of the project, so it'll still be within budget, if you will. No budget, no, no additional budget impact. And 
I, I don't expect really, we haven't had any, those last three projects have gone very well with him and, and no change orders. So I'm really not expecting anything. I think it's gonna be, you know, the, the base bid of 45,000, but we wouldn't even interested in Is this steel roof? Or is that asphalt? Is that a steel roof that they're putting on? No, yeah, they're gonna put a steel roof on. The old one is asphalt. Yep. And we've been kind of going for all of our past ones. We've been going to the steel roof for the longevity and, and uh, you know, just the longevity and the certainty with, with these structures. I would make the recommended motion. Motion by Supervisor Ross. Second by Supervisor Schessel. Any other comments? Sorry. Hey, I'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Number six, American Rescue Plan Act funding request for About Nature LLC, Center of Appropriation Access at Vermont County Park. Yeah, so as you know, we've been talking about um, this for a while. A uh, re real brief timeline um, that I wanted to just mention is. Uh, you know, we, we started um, with our receiving our first grant in 2017 in November. Um, to, we took 2018 and 19 to do engineering and design, a uh, very unique project, uh, international design standards. We started construction in late 2019 and it's continued till now. So phase one and phase two are done. The original intent and design here was um, uh, the design was gonna take us down and we were gonna have a switchback trail to the beach from there. Um, due to the recent high lake levels, um, that has changed. The, the bottom of the bluff has changed um, and it's steepened up significantly. So it's really this last 50 feet, if you will, um, that's an issue. Um, so in the packet, so right now our contractor has completed phase one, phase two. Uh, he also did the re-engineering and design essentially free of charge um, and uh, for what would be phase three, which we're um, kind of proposing here. Um, so it would be to reconfigure some of the last set of platforms and then kind of came up with a very unique design but has been used elsewhere uh, in his projects. So he re reconfigured the last few platforms and then uh, per the, um, the photos, that last run, which would make up this, this steep, roughly 20 to 30 feet, uh, kind of a vertical drop, would be kind of a retractable aluminum staircase. So the issue was the loading and that span, getting something that would work for that span. And so the unique design is this retractable uh, piece. It also allows us though to, to retract it accordingly to, uh, to changes. Um, you can see in the photo, this has been used um, in a residential situation with very effectively um, on, on one of his previous projects. So I included those in there. And you can see from the design sketch, what kind of design sketch is what he's proposing as far as uh, finishing out the staircase. So he's been really good to us. Uh, the reason I mentioned the timeline is, you know, we first contracted with him in 2019 and he's held his prices through this whole project. Um, we, we, had, we had a phase one contract with him, which of course he had to hold, but he held his original prices all the way through phase two. That has been significant uh, because of all the changes in cost of lumber and everything else recently. Um, so he's been very good to us with the con contract, but he, you know, he can't do phase three to get this, to, to get to, this, to the beach. Uh, you know, under that existing contract. And we realized that it's a different, you know, again, this this last part, he got the staircase where he said the original design was gonna go. It's just the, that last piece has changed. Um, so this would be the project. One of the other things I should say is our DNR grant, which was a, a stewardship grant, um, requires us to get to the beach. So it's, we're, we're somewhat obligated if we want that reimbursement to get to the beach and this is a, a good solution and he's uh, really done all the engineering and design to do this. So um, I'm just gonna, uh, we kind of put this on there. So the other thing is the timeline. He's done with phase two. Um, I put the, um, the the picture of the fence in there because he's kind of buttoned up the site. He's gonna 
pull off the site until we can, until we can get you know an agreement to, to to moving forward on phase three. Um, so we're, we are kind of at a standstill until we can can do that. And again, you know, he can't guarantee pricing. For, so if we come back in a year, or year and a half, or something, obviously the pricing is going to change. So that's why I brought it to you today. We're hoping to to continue this. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about ARPA and the, the timeline for that. You know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so one possibility is to to roll this uh, into those those projects for consideration. Um, I guess the other would be. You know, possibly through the capital. Um, I, I bring it into you today just because one, for kind of your consideration and recommendation, but also just knowing where we are in the timeline and uh, steps forward. I, I am very glad though that he was able to. We've been he's been working on it for the last couple of months, and we've been talking with him and also engineers at the state about about the fix here, and um, uh, everybody has uh, signed off on that. So. I think it's a good one. So bottom line, um, with, with that change order, if you will, um, sorry, let's flip over. We are looking um, at his, his uh, change order amount was 70,318. We're looking at adding a contingency. We're about 80,866 to do that. We have about $15,000 in the bank from donations that we continue to receive. Um, including just recently over the July 4th weekend, we received a $1,500 contribution donation. So we'll continue to do, pursue donations to offset this, but we're looking at about a 65,866 um, balance that, that we're looking to fund. Jason, can you um, answer the ZARPA money? Well, you, my opinion would be to take it out of golf course reserves if you want to do it expediently. There's nearly a million dollars sitting in the golf courses. Just a just a note on that. We um, and 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 I don't have um, problems with proceeding that way too for expediency. Uh, the golf course still we ordered golf carts two years ago. They haven't been delivered yet, so we still owe that those dollars on the golf carts. So that's close to a half a million that we want to make sure we have in reserves. But. There's still yeah, funds. There's a fifty five hundred thousand that's still coming. Um, about. So we have about half a million available. Yes. I, and we were we were at, actually at I think the last time I checked we were at like one point three. Yeah. yeah. So so there's reserves there. I I think it well I think it could be justified as an ARPA project too. I don't know what the ARPA timeline is to, to for the county board to consider those. Yeah, we probably won't get there till early fall, I would think. You know, depending on what the executive committee wants to do. So, so that you want to do this? I mean, this would just be a transfer of funds. There's some questions about the structure itself. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to sound like a question, this guys, but like this, the, the picture that shows here. And what's it doesn't look that safe. It kind of looks like a stairwell to no stairway to nowhere. So I understand your chance, but I guess what kind of all safes are there? What kind of so it it has it has all the railings. It actually yeah, it actually does meet code and engineering. So it, it does it will meet that's what we are kind of working through. It does meet the international design standards that is required. So the, the biggest thing was the loading. So as you notice, it's just a one passage now, right? So the rest of the staircase is wide, so we can account for you know multiple people passing and, and being on the project. But that last stretch would just be a single pass. So and, and uh, the photo that you're looking at this photo. Yeah, that's just. I don't think that's our stair. That's that's not our staircase. No, it's not. That's one. Yeah, it's a cleaner picture, but it's still yeah. well, a ten foot, eight foot drop. Well, there's kind of a where's the transition to it? I guess that's what what you're kind of looking at. You know, is that go to some sort of a platform, or does that yeah. carry on to the other stairs? That then all of a sudden, depending upon how high it is or lower, that you you can get onto it easier. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's a direct staircase off of the bottom platform, and the unique thing for the supporting is this this slide, so that 
uh, provides the, the engineering to, to bridge the loading and stuff. Um, but yeah, if, if you look at the overview sketch, basically he's reconfiguring these last platforms. So this will be um, reconstructed and that last platform to, to hold all the loading. And it's just really that last 20 feet. That is the, the aluminum staircase. Um, and that aluminum staircase, then the loading is restricted by the passage. So it's narrowed down basically. So we did do a lot to get that uh, engineered for, for that. If, I'll give you an example. I mean, I don't have a photo of it, but if you go to Rock Island, which is a state park, uh, they have kind of a very similar situation. It's just not, it, they're, they're you know, drilled into rock. Um, this is being supported by the platforms, and that's the engineering that he did. Um, so that's that. that'd be my next question from a stability, long term stability maintenance of it, since it's not, since it's supported by the wood structure. When the tide is high and water is high, um, applying a lot of pressure to the to the base is that going to Sense, right? yeah, yeah the whole thing is that of course we will yeah we've gone through a lot of this over the last five years but it, it again it is a pilot project so i mean there there aren't any guarantees but we did get a stamped engineer plan designed the international standards and that last supporting platform is on skids like the rest of them that is pulled back and holding basically the forces are pulling it back towards the bluff and up with anchors at the top. So it's, and then the, the big thing about this aluminum is that we have to bridge that 30 vertical feet, basically, or 20, 30 vertical feet. And that structure support, which he came up with, is pro being provided by that last platform. Are there international design standards for carrying kayaks and canoes down there? Um, probably not. But that's the requirement under the grant? Not under this one. Not under this, yeah, this no. but, oh, I, not none of this. No. Okay. None of our grants or anything for a kind of, we, didn't, we didn't really design it for that. Um, Clay Bluffs was was talking about that, uh, you know, feature that would allow for that. Uh, if we do that at Clay Bluffs, but well, I saw it somewhere on these diagrams. That's why I asked the question. Okay. But no. it's understood. It's kind of a no brainer. I mean, we, we've got to do this because it's like, you know, after phase one, we were making the joke. It's like a, like a stair to no go. Well, you, or can we, we've expended all this time and effort and grants and stuff to get down to 50 feet and raise the stop right there is just like, well, oh, that's not gonna. Right. No, I have a question that we have to get it across the finish line. I just was concerned. Yeah. Concern was over the solution. Not yeah. 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 Wait. And I and I appreciate that. And again, we we look at everything because again, part of the uniqueness here is that supported from the structure as. A, opposed to relying on the base you know for that structure because there's so we did look at other things with coastal management i mean just bringing in rock and stuff to to create a base a platform to land on is well over two million dollars so because we have to barge it in question uh if this is retractable yes is able to retract it is it like so it'll, it'll be yeah, our person going out there and making sure it's yeah. at proper depth and there's no, yeah. it's very hard for some kids to tamper with it. I guess that's my next question. Yep. So it's retractable. It would be locked out. Um, so most of the time it's just going to be down, right? But we have the option to retract it and or, you know, adjust it or close it, frankly, pull it all the way up and close it. Um, and that would be something that our park caretaker would do who lives on site. And it, and it, we talked about, you know, like having a solar winch, but the the basically the design would be a locked out manual winch to do that. So all all really good questions, and of course we don't have experience with this yet, um, but I was encouraged to see that we could get a solution to get us to where we want to be. So we so have question comes down to funding. The last the last thing I'll say, uh, I it, you know again. Understanding what I said about timeline and stuff. So the likely scenario for him, he's pulling off site, but as you know, part of the phasing for this project has been the best construction time for him is actually late fall of the winter. Yeah. So, you know, maybe a fall timeline for an award wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, if it if you wanted to consider it, you know, with other other funding, 
Um, I, I'm hopeful, I can't guarantee, but I'm hopeful he would keep his uh, bid contract change order price to the end of the year. That's kind of what we talked about because he admitted best time for him to finish construction is gonna be end of the year, but it, it wouldn't get done this year. Uh, I'm not saying that he wouldn't start earlier. We did do something earlier, um, but again, it depends on block conditions, which has dictated a lot of this construction. You have to have a separate, different motion at a different meeting. Yeah, you need to. Yeah. We, we can only go to this. You need to. Re you should let Andrew know where you'd like to come from, and then we can prepare that. Yeah. Budget yeah. transfer. Yeah. At the next meeting. Do you want to go with the ARPO, or would we rather just transfer money from the enterprise fund on the courses? I think there's not a shortage of uh, ARPA requests, so yeah. uh, we have no problem getting rid of the ARPA money. Right. So. Uh, rather than piling on that and this is a project we have to get over the finish line i think we have to find something outside the air would be my recommendation and then i would leave you know, letters of where that might be that's yeah by you by what do you think well i know that picture on 66 is scary you know yeah. if, we to, <laughs> if we have to get to the beach i don't know i guess we have to do this right that picture is not our thing, right? It's, no, it's not our thing. And I, I guess a residential picture or something. It's a residential uh, structure that he was trying to give an example, but it, it actually does. It looks like it's not all the way retracted, but it actually lands on those rocks, if you will. You know, the footing. So the rest of the work, work looks better than that picture, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you didn't even cut off the, the angle braces or anything. I mean, it looks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know when that was taken. He was just showing me as an example of, of what that, that aluminum staircase looks like. So the aluminum staircase actually comes pre-manufactured pre and engineered. So the aluminum staircase is rated uh, for that, that span and everything for the weighting um, at that. Again, it's like a two foot width or something. Um, and then the uniqueness is he's doing all the support from that last platform as opposed to relying anything on at the base of the shoreline. I guess I wouldn't want to see that picture show up in the old Ducky Press. <laughs> it will be very controversial. Yeah. The drawings, obviously, they show a better, I mean, looks a little more stable to me, but that picture I think would scare a lot of people. Well, I served Page 66. So that's not really our is no it isn't it isn't design? our structure it was just an example of that aluminum staircase bridging we've had very good coverage lately on the parks and everything but if that one shows up they'll say what are those people doing <laughs> what do you think um, um, well for that i mean when i was in the service uh you know coming on to from a dock onto a ship that was moving around a lot um there are aluminum ladders that actually articulate uh, and shorten up the, the rise of, of the, the each tread to present a and made out of aluminum, uh, supported from above, um, or some instances supported from below, but allowed that articulation, that movement. Um, so yeah, I'm not a professional engineer. I'm not trying to suggest a new solution, but. Uh, there are ways to, to, to deal with that, uh, maybe in the marine environment. Um, I don't, if, if we want to support this and we want to support it out of the Gulf Fund, we can change the motion, right? Yeah, but you still have to move the money. It, it would come back as like a yeah. transfer. Yeah, a transfer. Money. Right. I mean, we wouldn't have to then. We wouldn't get in direction that it's a go ahead today. No, you still have to move the money. No matter where you no matter where you take it from, you have to move the money. But what can, what do they do today then? Today they can just make the motion that they want to consider the funds from the Gulf yes. Coast Reserves. Yeah. yeah. So you still have to move the money. Well, you do a budget amendment, right? That's what we want to budget amendment at the next meeting. And that has to go to the county board. And that'll go to finance and then the county board. So we wouldn't we wouldn't sign the contract until that budget amendment was passed. That, that's our typical process. But just like accepting grants and so forth, we move into that budget amendment stage. I think if that was the good direction. Yeah. 
how do we safeguard ourselves? I mean, accepting this work that when it's done that it doesn't look like a residential. Well, I, I'm just saying, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, we got to protect ourselves if we're yeah. authorizing uh, this that, that, that it meets inspection or all I can say is that that's been the case all along. And so we have uh, stamped engineering plans that that show these the, the structure and these pieces of it. Right, but in the end, who final inspects it? Is it your local yeah. fire? It works on paper and chief, in or is it uh, <coughs> local inspections? I mean, who who deems it yeah. um, safe? And you know, because in the end, you want to be protected that it was. So the the permitting that we've needed and got it got for the structure has has largely been from the state, and so. Um, that's it there. That, that's all I can say is we have, you know, ultimately the stamp engineering design plans and that those, those they were built according to plan, but it is, it is very much a pilot project. I mean, this doesn't exist anywhere else. So sure. um, I, I don't know what to say beyond that. I was just wondering, how do we declare it safe? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm on these. I understand that it's not our. Yeah. Project, but. Well. And we don't have to accept this. I mean, it's just it's where we are right now with the the solution. That the, the other, you know, the only other thing I can suggest is that we would go back to the switch pick trail. Um, it would be, you know, it'd have to probably be constantly reconstructed, uh, which we we anticipated some of that might be needed anyway um, with the switch back trail. So we can. We can and probably will still have that as an alternate, which is switchback trail through kind of the slumped material um, adjacent. But you know that's going to have to be that's going to be an ongoing maintenance for that last 50 feet or so. So this was uh, another alternative for that. Well, there there would be an inspection, right? I, I mean, I think what we're talking about is if if we want to approve this approach and, and get some funding. You know that there would be some sort of after the fact inspection uh, uh, by people who are knowledgeable in such things. Uh, there's a recreational immunity aspect to coming on county property. Yeah. Um, but I think we should probably post some signage or you know right. that would would sharpen that. Uh, yeah, and and there's a and we've talked to the court council when we started the project, of course, as well. So there is a recreational immunity. There's a there's a catch 22 and Tony probably knows this too with posting too much because if you post too much, then you assume some yeah. liability that you don't know. Recognizing that there's a danger. Well, you, yeah. you, you assume some liability that don't otherwise assume. And so like, for instance, uh, our ice skating rink, if we said, you know, it's monitored all the time and then we don't monitor it all the time, that adds additional liability where we wouldn't have that if it's not signed, it's kind of at your own risk and we have recreational immunity. So the, the signage I'm thinking is, you know, use it your own risk. It yeah. requires uh, Understood. Or whatever. And, and that was envisioned. And just to that point though, the other thing that we probably would uh, put because it's, a, it's a, a loading issue is that that last stretch would be single pass basically, right? It, it's physically restricted to that. So it's hard to get, you know, more than the, lo the loading would. And if you had a person on every single stairs, that's how that only is the the permits, their weight restriction? Yeah, it's basically, so the engineering design for that aluminum stairs is, you know, basically, uh, I, no, I don't, I haven't seen an exact weight limit, but they do it such that if you had a person on basically every single that's wrong, awesome. wrong of the stairs, that that's what it's engineered for. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah. So but, what but I don't, do but we wouldn't post a weight limit, but I would, we're going to say something like single pass for that last stretch. My, my inclination is that is to use the enterprise fund because that, that's money that we have right here. Who knows if the board will approve the ARPA funds for this? That's right. Yeah. My inclination would not be to use the enterprise fund right. because it, it was generated by golf course and who knows what the office is going to look like in the next few years. Uh, and it's an enterprise fund for a reason to, to use it for that enterprise. Um, recognize there's a higher bar for getting some ARPA funding. Unless we approve this and then move this ahead and then let's see where this is. I mean, and honestly, I mean, this is kind of a recommendation because it has to go with the whole ARPA. I just, 
I needed some direction again for the contractor, et cetera. Um, so can, can maybe we, it didn't need to be action, but we did that. Could we approve this and then it, uh, leave our options open? No, like. Oh, I mean, you could. We like to have some some idea of what it's going to be like. I guess of my intent, I'm putting it this way, was that it it again, if you agree, either enterprise fund or but you would say, yeah, let's throw it in consideration for all the other ARPA projects, or no. That's one way to do it. But again, we'll be. I don't know what the timeline is, but I yeah, I think same we'll have. Definitive yeah. idea where we're at by the September board meeting is probably aggressive. Let's be honest, right? Um, there's, a, there's a there's a number of projects, so I mean, hypothetically, you know, that could push this out well into fall or potentially yeah. winter. You know, the, the enterprise fund balance is something that this committee has oversight of. You know, because you have oversight of Gulf operations. You know, we could look at the capital fund, uh, which has funding as well. You know, but that you know that kind of well, yeah, so correct. I mean, there's some you know, there's at least some. Uh, and internally, our there's a thread that flows through. If you wish to tap those enterprise, funds. I mean, you, know, you could say I, if you want to say I should talk to our finance director and come back with a recommendation next month. I'm happy to do that. Um, the enterprise fund, I mean, it's not historically just that's it, right? We've we've taken money from it before. I think the or the general fund has helped the enterprise fund from time to time, right? So just, with, just in the form of a loan. So the enterprise fund really has supported all the golf course. And then when we have to do equipment purchase and stuff, that there has been situations where we've gotten a loan for big purchases, maintenance, billing, whatever, and that gets paid back, but it does stand alone for a operation. Having said that, every year eighty thousand dollars in recent years goes to support the parks from the Gulf. That comes off in my in the budget proposal, if you will. Uh, eighty thousand from the enterprise fund goes to support kind of parks operations. Ten years ago and ten years before that, the Gulf course is owed the county yeah um, million dollars or more every year. So it kind of it's ultimately like, it's ultimately it's all county money. Ultimately, it's all county money. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Long term doesn't matter what fund it's in. If the county board says take it out of this fund and put it on this project, that's the that's the decision point. So I assume I need a motion to approve this with the, with asking finance committee for recommendation of well let's have finance staff. Yeah, yeah that's that. what's the yeah. finance staff. Yeah. Um, we'll bring back a recommendation at your next meeting. That's what I would even though if you need to make a motion, we so try to table look. this and uh, looking for a recommendation. I think, I, think, I think it's approving that we want to get this over the finish line and that this is the table or post. Well, do you want to? Are you? Do you want to approve the change order as it is? And maybe most of you approve the change order with a recommendation for funding to come from the finance staff. So the question is, can we ask finance staff to approve to uh, recommend a uh, source? A source. Well, like Julie just said, it's like you know, make a motion to approve the change, and then you know, with with a recommendation for right. finance. Jason would we'll probably be working on the home zone. I don't know how we can approve a change if we don't know if we have enough money. Well, basically, we're, we're approving an option and then finding out if we have enough money. I mean, if you look at that. Well, well there is. I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to get caught up in the, the back up. The back up is there is enough money in the enterprise fund. Right? Yeah, there is. There there is. is. Okay. Let's postpone this item until next meeting. We'll accompany it with a budget amendment that and we're and the funding recommendation will come from our from our finance team. That work? Yes. Right. And just and that works for your time my perspective. Yeah. And just just a little piece on that timeline. I, what I what I really wanted to get across is like it, you know, one, I think we could have a hard time getting another grant. So and that would be like a year to year and a half out. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm less concerned about like a decision, <laughs> you know, to do this. Uh, I just didn't want to take the good faith of the change order and say. 
you know, we might sign it in a year or something, you know. So that that was my that helps or makes sense. Yeah, table it, what he said. Do we have any motion to postpone? Well. Yeah, you have to do that. I'm just looking at the title of what the agenda item is, <clears throat> American Rescue Plan Act funding request. Um, so when you bring it back next time, it might not be that. Um, you know, I mean, I still think you could approve the change order, provided there is a recommendation. We can start from scratch. We can take no action on this. Kill this it. Yeah, we can kill it. We can kill this. <laughs> and then he just brings it back, however. Under, under yeah. recommendation, no action. Move on to the committee. Took no action. We'll we'll bring it back next month. That's the cleanest way. Moving on. Okay. No action. Uh, point of order. Uh, I apologize, but I do have 11:30. I have to get to, um, and I would like to, if we could skip to the uh, Clay Buffs Natural Preserve acquisition. I'll catch that before I have to take out early. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
the, the tightness of getting the Forest Service final grant contract award, et cetera, and bringing the money to closing, not, not having the money, but, but bringing it to closing. So um, we're pretty confident all that will come through. And then the last piece is we're, you know, I'm, again, I'm told by the land trust we're doing very well with the fundraising and that we should be able to hit that mark by August. So we're fully expecting to close with, with funds in hand. It's just, so the one complication, I guess, is the potential, potential, and I'm not there yet, uh, to need to front the money at closing, which if you, for some of you, you may recall, but uh, way back when the first round of this, uh, the county did, a, again, a different different scenario, we'd have to do it again, but the county did agree to, to front a million dollars at that time, knowing that it was going to be reimbursed. And so that's what I'm trying to get to is that certainty of reimbursement and everything. Um, but ideally, uh, get all the funds in closing. We resolved some other acreage issues. So with this EPA grant, there was some overlap between Fish and Wildlife acreage and EPA. And uh, over the last two months, we finally come to resolution there and they all agreed and they're all good. So that took some time, but we're, we're good there. So the update is we expect to close. Um, there is this little nuance, these nuances with um, two of the federal grants in particular on uh, timing. Um, but we hope to have that straightened out and hopefully have an, an answer for you um, by August. Jason had asked me the other day, but a, a timeline would still work if NRC took up some sort of action in August, uh, the August meeting, and then subsequently a September county board that still works because the close, the option of purchase is uh, mid-September. So we're, we're, we're cutting it close, but we are moving in the right direction. And I will say, as of late, the agencies have been working very quickly on our behalf. Um, normally, we had to do a scope change for the Fish and Wildlife Grant because of the EPA grant. Normally, that would be a, a year-long process, and they did it in two months for us. So everybody is being very responsive, and we're getting everything we can. Uh, and, was, and there was talk that if we had to, we could have a special meeting. Yeah, this month. Uh, the That'd be another option. So I will know. I will know a little bit more when I get the appraisal because that'll determine kind of the valuation. I'll, I'll know much more when I get the appraisal review from DNR because that'll get forwarded to Forest Service, and then I'll know kind of the final answer when Forest Service gets to review that, which probably will be in August by the time Forest Service reviews that. And the money is again obligated and awarded. It's just whether we can get it to closing. And, and if that, that valuation changes significantly, which I'm not really expecting it to, given all of our appraisals and everything, but <clears throat> if that valuation changed significantly, there is a possibility that there would be a reduction from the 600,000 full award. Um, I, I don't, it's possible. So being proactive rather than waiting for the last minute, because we ask that we had, um, had prepared to have a, a, something to vote on that gets this across the finish line, um, either be it next month or a special meeting. I just, I appreciate you doing all the work you're doing and it sounds like you're running a team man trying to tie this all up. Uh, I just want to have that safety net rather than a no shit, like now we're out of time. Yeah. So um, could I ask that uh, yeah. you work with Jason or I, I, I don't know. We, we can have that and, you know, it'll, uh, again, I just wanted to know what that action would be. Um, but we can have that, and it, it probably will come along the lines of that, you know, probably pro probably coming along the lines of the fronting that million dollars if there's some uncertainty. Yeah, you're, you're in it way more than we are, so yes. we're yeah. in it, and just my direction I give you is bring us something we can vote on to get this across the finish line. Appreciate that. Yeah, we will, we will do that. And the reason I didn't feel comfortable bringing that today is just, you know, some uncertainty on what, what, what I was asking you to take action on. So I think um, I, I, I think to, to Tony's point, I mean, there may still may be details that you don't know at either our special meeting um, in August, uh, and, and you could write a resolution or a, uh, a motion that authorizes up to whatever the maximum you might might mm -hmm. see. And that would give flexibility for those final. Yeah, 
All the other, by the way, maybe I should have prepped this. All the other grants, all the Fish and Wildlife grants, uh, the NOAA grant, we have those contracts. Those funds are, we're, we've been done our due diligence. We fully expect those to be available at closing. So it really is those, probably those two. Yeah, I just don't want to be rushing. Yes. We're already kind of pushing the deadline as much as I'm a little uncomfortable already how close we are. So uh, with that said, yep. if action needs to be taken, I want it moved out of discussion and into yeah. resolution. Yep. So we need a special meeting. So the, the front time, the float, the loan, or the float, or the float loan, bridge loan, uh, would be really two months time frame. Good question. So we, yeah, we, I, again, from what I know today, we, I think it would be on the order of 60, maybe 90 days before we be able to get reimbursement from the federal government. And what I, one of the things I want to ensure is, you know, what is that number? And are we, you know, for sure going to get, you know, reimbursed to that amount? Like yes, about sixty to ninety days, I think. And the bank can't be flexible, or like no <laughs> money's there. It's like they, they we've can't. we've been that through there with them. So uh, I'll just I won't answer for them, but we, we I'm sure they're getting pressure from a a uh, an unknown developer to hold fast. The the good news is that we are very confident that we'll have the funds for closing. The appraisal uh, costs and, and uh, good question. So we did get uh, Forest Service to approve it. So actually, uh, they will allow us to take these new appraisal uh, costs. And fortunately, since DNR is going to do the appraisal review, there's no cost there to us. Uh, but the appraisal costs will come out of the Forest Service grant. Right? So it will be a little bit less than six hundred thousand, but only by the amount of the appraisal, which I I should look. It was a it was around I hate to even give a number. I think it was around thirty five hundred dollars. We haven't gotten the grant yet, but so it's weird for us to but whatever. Yeah, no, I just got permission to do that. Well well I, obviously I'll have to pay it out of uh, parks operations until I can get reimbursed. But it ultimately the plan is to take it from Forest Service Grant. We also do should that fall through, should we get $0 from Forest Service, we do also have appraisal costs and eligible costs with our um, EPA grant. And the other, you mentioned the, the remote possibility that the appraisal might reveal some lower per mm -hmm. acre price, and which would present a different sort of shortfall than just a, uh, a two month yes. bridge loan could fill. Yes. And just to be clear about that, the appraisal has been accepted by everybody else. So it's it's really an appraisal for these 40 acres. It's not even going to be a per acre. It's going to say this is the value of these 40 acres for Forest Service. I hope so, you gave them a good parcel. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, they got the parcel that met all their program requirements. So, um, I, I'm so I'm just concerned. I guess I I mean there's been so many obstacles here. I just you know what happens if there is a shortfall and how do we fill that? I mean to your point, that's that's one more hiccup that could happen. Oh, and we should prepare it. Yeah, and then I'll probably have to write that. And I would go to the golf enterprise fund for that. <laughs> uh, and I'll probably have to write that into the resolution, or I'll talk to Jason about what the best way to do that is. But I think that's why I didn't want to bring it here is because I don't know. If, I'm asking you for six hundred thousand because we're not going to get we're going to get zero from courses or if I'm just asking you, you know, for floating it. I also do have to run, but I guess yeah. one thing I'll leave on this is maybe it's two separate resolutions and we take no action because we don't mean to, but be prepared in two separate resolutions next month. <coughs> uh, so it gives us the flexibility that we didn't have on the last thing we just tabled. So if we chose um, to use, it, yeah, so, could be an be it on this or wherever have multiple um so give us the flexibility that we're not squeezing out again. Thanks. With that I leave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. And I'm used to yeah. yeah I guess that's an NRC decision. I think it's still a county board. Correction. Correction. I, just, I just want to make sure I understand the reason for that. Because I don't want to go to the category, right? 
So yeah, if you guys feel the <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't have a budget. There's no money. There's two hundred thousand dollars of county money. That's your budget. And grants accepted. That's it. You know, I have to look back. I think the previous resolution, circa twenty fifteen. Yeah. And specific to, yeah. It did fronting the, the money. Yeah, and I'm not. Yeah. I just want to understand why, you know, because you have no money. We have no budget. You have no budget. It, you know, I don't, I don't think you could. We have a, a budget only as it relates to these specific grants. All right, so you got your marching orders done. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so let's move on. I mean, you can't direct Andrew to fund money on the like golf courses. You know, <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no budgetary line item in in the golf course budget. Yeah, even the well, other, I mean, so so, so for the staircase, Michael. I mean, so for the staircase, that still goes to the county board. That's yeah. a budget amendment. Any movement of money requires a two thirds vote, unless it's approved. And now, if the board would have said put a million dollars in reserve or whatever it is, you know, last year in the budget, majority vote, done deal. Once the once the budget's approved, two thirds vote to move money. And that's you know that's that's the main reason. There's no established budget to do this. Now, if there was a line item a land purchase line item or something, you know, and it was obviously line items go over budget, but yeah, I mean, there's, which there isn't, just to be clear. There's, our finance director would be <laughs> running around with the, yeah, his, his hair on fire. <laughs> so, and the county board would too. <laughs> so what are your desires, Supervisor Ross? <laughs> I, I can have a lot of desires that don't fit with <laughs> Yeah, you know, my, my dad used to say you could wish in one hand and, and spit in your other hand and then see which hand gets full faster. <laughs> he used a different word for wish, but. I, I will have a... Uh, I guess I will prepare a resolution to talk. Yeah, I think we just need to know the amount. And, yeah, and yeah. We may or may not know by August, and that's the that's the. Now there may be a. I don't know. We'll have to look at it legally in terms of how we. Well, that may be just a majority vote. Potentially, I don't know. I don't know the answer there, except I would probably look to what we've done in the past, which I think was likely a. I don't know. I have to see what we did. And we did the, the fronting of, you know, whether that requires a two thirds vote or whether we did, you know, because we're, yeah. Right. I, it feels like two thirds vote. Right. But. I will bring this back next month, right? So, uh, I will have something for you as an action item. Um, and it'll have as much detail as I can provide at that time. Okay. All right, let's, let's run through the rest of these things. Yeah, I, I do have a lot, so I'll try and be quick. Um, update on, on uh, Lion's Den uh, Pavilion and specifically change orders. So there was a few minor change orders that were included in your packet. Um, glad to ask or answer any questions about those. Uh, one of the, they, they were all right around $1,000. There's three of them. Um, one of them, for instance, was putting a hose bib on outside a building. It just accidentally didn't make it into the architectural plans, even though it was asked for. So it's a change order because we really need a hose bib on the outside. So fairly minor, though, for Lion's Den. Uh, construction out there is moving along really well. Um, we, I, I had actually thought maybe we would, um, you know, be seeing walk, uh, 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 walk through and punch list. Um, here in the first week of July, but I think we're probably looking at um, uh, mid July to end of July for that. So hopefully um, by August 1st, we'll have occupancy for for the Lions Den Pavilion. And so far, all all is good. And 
not too much in the way of an unexpected expense. Cover Bridge Park Pavilion, we did do the punch list item with the contractor. He still has a few items to, to deal with out at Cover Bridge, but it is essentially done. Um, and the next step, well, we already started some, you can see in the handout I provided the packet, but uh, we already started some landscape work. Uh, we're waiting to finish up the rest of it based on uh, some things we needed, we energies to do, and also the contractor. Um, but Cover Bridge is, is essentially done, which is, which is good. Um, and I think it, it turned out really, really nice. I think um, it's going to be a, a great asset. It's unfortunate that our pavilion is opening when our bridge is closing, but so be it. Um, can't do much about that. Uh, H.H. Peters. Um, so this one is uh, this one has been an ongoing um, challenge. H.H. Uh, Peters, though, I included a whole bunch of photos, uh, the remodel. It, you know, it's working really well, but we had to go through redesign. As you remember, there was a big kind of all the utilities were in the poured concrete floor. That was our big change order. But we had two more included in your packet. Um, one was that we realized in order to upgrade our lock sets for the new doors we were getting, um, we, we did that out. And all the existing locks on the building were residential in nature, and they all had septic keys, um, which is a nightmare. So we decided to go ahead. We were already replacing half of them with the new doors that were inserted. So we did a commercial grade lock, a standard key lock. <coughs> so that's a change order, which was not cheap uh, on the order of 4,000 something. The other one was the valves, which I talked about previously, and also some insulation that needed to occur um, with that valve installation. That was a big one. Basically, all the valves. Every last one of the valves in the building had to be replaced. They were just corroded and no good. Um, that was another big change order. So we are nearing completion. The contractor is still working on a few punch list items for us, but we are nearing completion. You see the photos. I, I will say though, the bottom line with the, all the change orders all in is we are about $18,000 over what we had budgeted. So um, at the end of the day, uh, we, we had to get the project done. And um, if we didn't approve the valve change order, for instance, we wouldn't have water. <laughs> so it was something we needed to get done. And we tried to keep it as tight as possible. We did challenge them on a number of change orders, including the last one on the insulation. We, we split the cost on that with the contractor because they really didn't, didn't, didn't get our approval before doing it. Um, but they did do the work. So at the end of the day, we're right around it's 17,000 and, and some change uh, over what our, our budget was was at. So but we are nearing completion with the punch list items. Um, I'll just keep rolling on here. Um, update on planning parks capital projects, each logical division. Uh, again, included in your packet, uh, one of my staff put together a nice summary PowerPoint. Uh, we had AmeriCorps here for last month doing invasive species, tree planting, um, and, and some other work for us. So that went really well. Uh, I do have a question to ask of you, um, which is we also had a national survey group that's, that's doing surveys uh, with uh, hosts of AmeriCorps groups, and they're, they're evaluating the program, basically. So they interviewed us, and they were here for uh, the AmeriCorps stay to evaluate their time with us, and then they interviewed us. They would like to interview one of the committee members. Um, so I don't know if anybody would have an interest. I could talk to you after the meeting. Um, it would be helpful. They would really appreciate it. But um, again, if, if not possible, it's a request. So um, I'll keep moving on. And if you do have an interest, I, I would really appreciate talking to you afterwards. It, it should probably only take about an hour of your time for the survey. And it can be done remotely through the virtual. Um, I'll keep going, but WISCOR. Uh, uh, WISCOR just started their stay with us. They're going to be with here for a month. They're working on some of the same items, and then they'll be back in fall. Um, I already mentioned that we're working on a few fish passage construction projects on Sucker Brook with landowners. Those will start happening next month. And then lines and parking uh, associated with the pavilion. So uh, highways been working on drainage improvements and parking improvements, and that's going really well. The, the rough grading and um, rough 
parking lot insulation and drainage issues have been done. So we're hoping that paving will occur uh, within the next month or two, depending upon highway schedule. So that's going pretty well though. I just, I just drove through there this morning um, and yeah, it's there's speed bumps there. Yes, there's speed bumps for sure. It, it is gonna get paved, it's just uh, the grading was done and then so we, we just need to get now time away from highway to pave. It really looks great there, by the way. So they are painting the beams today and, and the areas. I think both pavilions just turned out awesome. And yeah. I, I just think they're they're really going to be helpful. <clears throat> really, yeah, really, really nice. It's been a, it's been an interesting oversight process, though. Uh, we talked about updated clay bluffs. Update and historic cover bridge. You heard most of it from Jason yesterday. Uh, I just wanted to detail a little bit on the fix. So uh, I've been working with John Edgerton and Highway. The engineering for that would be to keep the historic look and everything of the structure. And just, uh, you, you may not have known, but we actually, I, I couldn't find it in our files to be honest, but we had done a similar fix on the, of the southern abutment. Uh, almost in the, the yeah, same fix. And so this would be a fix for the northern abutment and the beams. That, that northern abutment is still the old stone structure. So on the south end, they poured a new one. So that's probably what's going to happen. So we're hoping it, it doesn't affect the historic look and we're assured that it isn't. They're going to be banding the beams and stuff. So I don't expect that there's going to be a lot of other, you know, metal cabling or anything that needs to occur. Uh, the one last thing, I don't know if Jason mentioned or not yesterday, but that one last thing is, as you know, uh, the actual auto bridge for um, Uncovered Bridge Road is being repaired right now. It's out. Um, one of the things about fixing the historic cover bridge is they really needed to have that bridge there and stage on it and stuff. So again, we're contracting with the same contractor and that's saving us money because they're already mobilized with a crane, which in and of itself is like $50,000 to get to a site. Um, so Bottom line is though timeline, as Jason said yesterday, it's going to be closed all summer and likely into fall to pedestrian traffic. We have it signed, but they really need that other bridge to be done before they can start work on an historic covered bridge. I'm hopeful that the county board will, uh, you know, set aside a necessary fund to, to take that on, uh, up. Um, Discussion on part revisions to park ordinance. Um, I had a couple residents contact me, um, two residents actually specifically about um, what they observed and actually it occurred to me that I had observed stuff similar that I wanted to address. On and that is specifically, we don't have a restriction against collecting items in the park. So I've been inquired before, can I pick mushrooms in the park? Um, and then there was even like a mushroom group that was coming, um, but, uh, it was noticed by some of our residents, there was some collecting of things going on at Lion's Den. So while there's there's some specific language about you know picking vegetation and stuff, uh, there isn't this kind of addressing it. So I will come back with a recommendation, but I we, we have some, that's one of the big items, but we have some cleanup items to do in the park ordinance I wanna bring forward. Um, and we had also talked about kind of addressing some of the block safety issues. So I'm hoping this, we did. A, we've done a lot of research on that. I'm hoping to incorporate that into some changes with our park ordinance. Um, and then, lastly, we've had a couple of um, unpermitted connections to the inner urban trail uh, or construction on the inner urban trail. Um, one was uh, they're they're like associated. So one was a culvert replacement, and they tore out a portion of the trail, but they didn't get a permit from us or anything for that activity. And another has been like some connections to subdivisions, which also has to go through permitting because we only allow so many connections a certain distance away, kind of like an access ordinance, if you will. So um, I'm probably going to put more specifics into our ordinance for that as well. That will be on the trail because we've had we've had some issues. So, um, so I'm just giving you a heads up on that. Uh, and we'll have some recommendations coming forward. And then um, 2023 department budget highlights, um, very, very high, high level. I'm glad to talk to any of you about budget preparation as we go forward here. Um, we'll have some capital projects. They'll be on the order of some existing projects that you guys have already uh, kind of approved grants for and stuff and where we have uh, still some, some dollars to come up with. So 
Vermont stormwater, Meek One stormwater, um, the staircase as we've talked about. So, so some things of capital will be in in our in my budget for consideration. Um, just just a, a, a piece of information. The other thing I've been working with Jason, but one of the other budget impacts will be moving our part-time Vermont caretaker who has resigned to a full-time position. Um, I'm still hoping that we'll hire somebody this year uh, in that full-time role, but that'll be represented in the budget, part-time to full-time. And just as an FYI, our other two caretakers have gone full-time too. So the one at Mequon and the one at Laudonia, that was done in previous budget. So, um, so we're doing the same at Vermont. <laughs> we're going to go to a park management uh, district. Uh, and so even though you know, in the past they really were focused on the park where they live, now they're going to get kind of a series of parks that they're primarily responsible for. So I can share more with you on that. But um, you heard Andy talk about shoreland zoning maps. So one of the things we need to do is update our shoreland zoning maps with changes in navigability, et cetera. So I'm going to have some money in there for sewer pack assistance because it's been a while since we did that and it's uh, we need some assistance because it's pretty detailed JS modeling um, work uh, to to get to get to those maps. So I'll have that um, in there. Um, I'll probably again for your consideration have a piece on continuing our right away invasive species work. We did get a grant that we were hoping to get, and um, right now we don't have any funding to continue to work with highway on, on controlling invasive species in the right of ways, particularly the county trunk high, highway right of ways. Um, so I'm hoping to include a little nominal amount to just try and address some of those um, worst areas. And then obviously there'll be some um, new expense re related to our new pavilions. Uh, not much, but obviously there'll be new maintenance items around that. And then I do have a few major reports real quick. Um, so uh, County Highway I is closed, many of you know. Um, our golf courses have been doing really well financially. So June, we uh, recently, I should say, June, we had a record month again, compared even to last year in 2020. June was a record month. So we're catching up, but we had a very, very slow start. But we are catching up to our revenues for past years. Uh, but now with County Highway I closing, we are a little bit concerned about the revenue coming into Hawthorne Hills. I worked very closely with DOT, uh, got them to put up some signs for us, uh, free of charge, which they don't normally do, but you know, they're they free trying to be very helpful. Uh, but we do expect some impact to the golf course, particularly at Hawthorne Hills with that closure on I. It's just, it's just not great timing for us because it's right in the middle of our season. But it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, talked about the interim trail already. Uh, I just wanted to mention too, I know a lot of you have been aware of this too, but um, for, for us, COVID impact to my staff and their time off and stuff actually did more in 2022 than both in 2020 and 2021. So, you know, we're seeing time off and COVID impact still. So I just kind of want to make you aware of that because it, it is impacting our operations. We're doing the very best we can to cover and stuff, but uh, we've had more, I've had more sick leave due to that in 22 than in any previous year. So um, I did bring for you if you want to take one, our new tourism guide is out and I'll let you take one if you'd like. Um, also in your packet was a change, emergency change order we had to do at Mequon Golf Course. We had to put in new HVAC system. It was a $10,000 that also was coming out of our enterprise fund. Really had no choice, had to fix it. We've been having issues on and off for years. Um, so that hopefully will address it. Um, but that, that amount was in your packet. That was in your packet. Um, so that was a, for the Mequon Golf Course. We'll be at the booth, uh, County Fair again with a booth staffing um, for August. Um, Hawthorne Hills Maintenance Building is um, uh, starting up for construction. Um, we have all our state approvals. We had a pre-construction meeting. We are being held up right now a little bit um, on a town of Sockville building permit, and we're hoping to get that resolved. I did reach out to the town chairman, and he assured me that they would um, get on that. We actually, the contractor submitted it back in early May, so I'm really hopeful that we can get going because uh, very soon uh, we will start seeing ramifications for 
you know, delays in construction. But we are getting going on that. Um, so far, so good, I guess. Um, construction for that. Um, talked about the, the revenues. Um, and they talked about the evaluation for AmeriCorps. So that is it. Thank you. I did look at the 2015 resolution that was approved, and the committee recommended taking a million dollars from the general fund and then set a not to not to exceed net purchase price of two hundred thousand dollars. So that was from the committee recommended a million out of the general fund, and then went to finance another county board. So that's how it was handled in, in 2015. A larger resolution. Yeah. I think that one, yeah, that one had more to do with all the relationship with the developer. Right. The actual moving of money and sort of fronting the money was a was a transfer from the general fund. <clears throat> with that. That's good enough because that was also where we can identify a gap. That's where the, two, the initial two hundred thousand came from. I guess come in through subsequent county funds. And that, that was a, that was a match for our original. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Joint Venture One grant, which we have um, taken them through the ringer because we've rescoped that. Four, we've taken that grant and rescoped it four times, just just different areas. Obviously, the same project, which but they've been very good to us. So, yeah, just so committee knows how. Okay. All right, all right. The next meeting date is going to be August fourth. Coast Guard's birthday. Okay. With that, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion adjourned. Thank you. Supervisor Shesso, seconded by Supervisor Joe. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank if you. there's anybody that would Thank be willing you. to survey with AmeriCorps, let me know.